Thanks for being here today. My name is Mr. Beats, and we are streaming live. Uh, we've got some pretty important stuff to talk about, and when I say we, I have a whole panel, a uh, team of us history YouTubers, I guess you call us, um, but we are going to look at um, some context, attempt to add some context to the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and this is a, it's something that I think a lot of people have asked us to talk about, um, but something that we need to first remember is that um, historians generally are just kind of sitting back and watching. We we look we look at the past, and um, I mean I, I don't even consider myself a historian, but you know. Folks who are into history, we don't really even comment much on current events. Um, although I think this is maybe a bad thing because I think uh, probably the, the folks who study history do need to chime in more on, on current events um, because it does seem that people lose context pretty easily. So that's why we're doing this today. Um, I think there's a lot of a, a lot of misinformation online. I think that's. Uh, no doubt. And we've seen a lot of propaganda out of Russia, in particular, um, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, is notorious for his misinformation campaigns that he's, he's something he knows a lot about going back to his going back to his KGB days. So it's uh, we are fighting misinformation. Um, a lot of the good faith um, streamers and uh, YouTubers, TikTokers, they come in good faith. They're trying to explain the situation, but they also just lack of lot, a lot of information that I think is, uh, is not good for a, a better understanding of this conflict. So that's why we're doing this. Um, it's not to exploit the, uh, the uh, situation at all. In fact, this stream uh, is not monetized all. Um, Everything on here is going to be donated to the Save the, uh, the Ukraine Children Fund, which uh, clearly we, uh, we're all pretty sympathetic to um, Ukrainians, what they are going through right now. Um, and there's other ways, there's other organizations you can donate to. Uh, if you check the link in the description of this video, um, I have a, a direct link to the Ukrainian Red, Red Cross that you can donate directly to. Um, but all proceeds go to those charities uh, or the Ukrainian, uh, the Children Fund. There's over a million children who have been displaced, um, at least already from this um, this invasion. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the panel. Um, just a note that Alternate History Hub may not be able to make it now. He uh, had something come up, but we have someone else here to take his place. So that worked out pretty well. Um, so first off, I'm going to introduce, uh, we have Emperor Tiger Star. Um, well, no. you're on. Uh, next up we have uh, his channel's M Laser, uh, but his name is Matus and he's, well, yeah, there's the narrow view there. Next up we have uh, Cypher from the channel, The Cynical Historian. And we have Tariq from the channel Hikma History. Oh, you got your cat there with you, uh, Cypher, too. And uh, and finally, thank you uh, especially to Ilkin from the channel Kings of, Kings and Generals for uh, hopping on kind of at the last minute. So, hey guys, thank you all for being here. And I think the um, the big question that I try to I'm asking for this whole stream, and this is what I titled this stream, is why did Russia invade Ukraine? It took the world mostly by surprise, perhaps historians a little bit less by surprise, but um, so maybe uh, if you could all go, I, we, have a, we have an outline, a document to get into that we've been uh, preparing, but I think just to kind of get us started here, like the big uh, question to answer in your opinion, why um, I know it's a big one. <laughs> Why Putin decided to invade uh, Ukraine now? So, how about Emperor Tiger Star? You go first since you're right. At the... 
I wish I knew because in, in my mind, I didn't expect like an invasion of like this scale to happen. I thought it was going to be more salami tactics. Like, like, okay, recognize the, the breakaway republics and the Donbass. Like I, I could have seen that, but like the, the flat out, like full invasion of the country, I really didn't think that would happen. And I mean, maybe you can make arguments like, Oh, he's Putin's been in absolute power for almost 20 years. Maybe it's finally going to his head. Maybe it's because he's getting old. Maybe it's a mix of the two. I don't know. I, I I'm not in his like, head i can see why like he would like want control of ukraine but i i still have no idea like why he actually just went and jumped the gun it, it definitely caught me by surprise all right yeah uh matus you want to uh as okay <laughs> as for a reason why i i guess uh it would go back to the fact that russia has always seen ukraine and belarus as their as their land and and those people as theirs not not necessarily theirs but it's like them part of them so so to them uh they they've seen ukraine and many of them have seen ukraine kind of like hungarians have seen hungarians outside of uh, hungary after the trianon after world war one so uh i i think it was mainly that that there was this sentiment in in russia uh because it's not just putin there's a lot of people in russia that believe this uh that Uh oh, I think he locked up there. All Is right, that a well, Wi-Fi problem? Yeah, it might be on his end. So we'll just keep. We'll come back to Matus there. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's go to uh, cynical historian. What what do you think? Oh, <clears throat> it's it's a uh, multipolar, and when it comes to that, uh, uh, so. For the most part, I certainly didn't see this actually coming as like a full-on invasion. Um, I much like most people thought that most of it was uh, posture. And most of the military buildup on Ukraine's border was posturing specifically to keep uh, to keep the uh, um, to keep Ukraine out of the uh, EU. But um, then he went the extra step. And and just like uh, Matus uh, put it out, it, it there is this deeper history of um, seeing Ukraine as the Ukraine, which uh, translates to like the borderlands um, or the frontier, as in um, the edge of the Russian Empire. Um, and you know it used to be the breadbasket of the Russian Empire and all that kind of stuff. But there's also a a um, very um, structural uh point when it comes to putin's um want to invade because uh there's been this whole movement of ukraine moving towards the west as uh, symbolized by the eu and that and it uh, has been a significant uh challenge to his own power uh specifically in stuff like the maiden uh, revolution of 2014 that's when uh, of course the uh the um they took uh crimea and um that was very much a challenge to putin's power because uh the the previous president that got overthrown by the maiden revolution was um was very much leaning eastward and the the entire revolution was very much a refutation of that and so that challenged putin's internal power as oligarchs start to uh, as russian oligarchs start to see putin as a um paper dragon that he uh, that he significantly loses power um every time one of these things take place so it's it's not just that it is a uh, that it's purely um, a want for territory or anything. It's also uh, Putin kind of uh, helping himself, uh, uh, fortifying his power. That's the word. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so to Tariq uh, from Hikma History, what do, what do, what's your uh, overall big picture? Why did Putin decide to invade Ukraine now? So the the vital question is now, right? 
because I feel like without yes. now it would be a, it's like okay. Now I think it's largely to do with the fact that Putin's seen the strength of the West decline, at least say in the last 12 years, quite noticeably, and their ability to be able to affect uh what they like their own vision in the rest of the world. Um and how they themselves, with some of their own internal problems, I should say me as well, I'm living in the West, uh, are going through some of their own internal social problems, like in America, for instance, last six, seven years, uh, with all of the social uprest there. And it's emboldened Putin to the, po to the point where he probably made a calculated strategic uh, guess that I won't get so much blowback now or the chances of me getting blowback from a western government uh is not going to be as high as it was say like in 2003 with george bush um i think that is probably yeah that makes the most sense to me about why it is now i mean why they did it in general i think we can go a little deeper into that but yeah in terms of now that's why i think okay uh ilkin if uh uh, yeah, I uh, kind of hate analyzing uh, people like Putin because uh, there's almost never any rhyme or reason, in my opinion. Uh, the question is always is why now and not eight years ago or five years ago or uh, a year from now. Uh, what we hear from Russia is that Putin is getting uh, exceedingly uh, isolated and this isolation is uh, his own choice. Uh, some claims that it's connected to the COVID situation. Some claims that uh, there is a shift in power structures. Uh, but regardless, uh, there are fewer people uh, who have access to him and fewer people uh, he listens to. Uh, it's almost always said that uh, Russian ruling elite has three columns. Uh, one of them uh, is a military. One of them is a uh, uh, the oligarchs and the third one is often called liberals, but it's mostly uh, technocrats uh, who are almost always uh, for more cooperation with the West, with uh, integrated uh, economic systems, etc. And apparently the third uh, column that uh, was advising Putin lost most all, 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 all of its influence on him. And hence, uh, he is isolated uh, and mostly gets his advice from the uh, military structures right now. And apparently, uh, some claims that he was misled into thinking that it will be a, a small victorious war, a quick one. Obviously, we'll get deeper into that, but uh, I feel like uh, it's uh, this happened mostly due to the uh, misleading uh, intelligence. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the most important thing I think we can do now is to uh, to go back and uh, look at the history of relations between um, Ukraine and Russia. I think most uh, streamers, TikTokers, YouTubers have uh, kind of dropped the ball on this one in terms of they go back to 1991. You know, like, uh, and so I think we need to go way back, much further. And so, um, whoever wants to chime in first can. But I think uh, let's look at the history of um, the. Oh, and something I, I, I forgot to say earlier um, is if you want to know about the propaganda that that Putin does talk about, uh, if you want, like, he is he literally does. He's been trying to rewrite history for a long time, but if you look at you look at his 21st of February speech, um, recognizing the Donbas republics, um, his 2014 March 19, 2014 speech to Parliament about Crimea, and then he has a paper that he wrote last year called "On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians." Um, just to oversimplify it, it's basically, you know, his whole thing is. Ukraine isn't a real country <laughs> um, that it, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to, it's always was meant to be part of Russia. So um, let's, I think we need to really dispel that myth a lot right now. So let's, um, what, what are the origins of um, 
you, the Ukrainians. Let's start with that. <laughs> Try not to be too long. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, first we'll have to go back to uh, the, the first kingdom that, well, kingdom polity that uh, uh, the the Eastern Slavs trace their national and ethnic origins to. All of them, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Russians, um, Ruthenians. Uh, and that is the Kievan Rus. And the Kievan Rus was the first that we know of, at least, uh, uh, polity in, in Eastern Europe, Eastern Slavic polity that existed. Uh, but it wasn't really Eastern Slavic, quote unquote, because even though Slavs were the majority uh, of that polity, which existed from late 9th century until the 13th century, um, it, it was a very multi-ethnic state. And most medieval kingdoms were very multi-ethnic states. Uh, uh, and uh, and if you want to know more about like these myths on uh, how medieval kingdoms are usually used by modern historians to find their ethnic and national origins on, uh, read the book uh, Myth of Nations. Uh, it's a very good book that talks about this uh, medieval kind of ethnogenesis of modern nations and people. Uh, but Kievan Rus is that medieval ethnogenesis for for Eastern Slavic states today. Uh, even though, uh, as I, uh, as, even though talking about that state in a way uh, where you're just saying it's Slavic would be wrong, because there were Khazars in it, there were Jewish merchants in it, there were Volga Bulgars, there were Varangians, which were these basically Vikings, but in the east, uh, which formed the ruling class of the Kievan Rus. Uh, there were um, many nomadic other peoples, Turkic peoples. Uh, so it was very much a multi-ethnic kingdom uh, and talking about it in any other context than, than it being a product of its time would be wrong. However, all modern Eastern Slavic nations, just as well as any other nations like France with Franks, uh, all modern Eastern Slavic nations, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, trace their national origins to this and talk about it as their own state and as something that's theirs. Um, so that's kind of where uh, the Eastern Slavs, quote unquote, came from, that state, uh, which then in the 13th century got conquered by the Mongols. Uh, however, when the Mongols came in, they conquered most of the eastern parts of the Kievan Rus and the western parts, which are mostly today Belarus and Ukraine, came under the control of the Lithuanians, which later came under control of Poland, creating the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So the people, these uh, this multi-ethnic people, which were majorities of Slavs, but there were also others, came under the control of this m different kingdom. Uh, whereas uh, the, the people that were become later Russians were still under control of uh, the Mongols, the Golden let's, Horde. Yeah, let's speak to the difference, how they like how that created these cultural differences that even last to this day. It, we don't speak on that. Uh, yes. So the cultural differences. Uh, well, the main one, especially in the Middle Ages, was religion. Uh, religion was a huge identifier for people, oftentimes bigger than ethnic identifiers. For In the Middle Ages, often what was more important to people was whether you identified as a Christian and what kind of Christian, rather than if you were a Frank or a, a Slav or whatever. Uh, so when it came to religious thing, differences, when Vladimir uh, of, of Kiev converted Kievan Rus into Orthodox Christianity in the 10th century, uh, 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 basically, um, what is it called? A metropolitan was set up in Kiev, which was which oversaw basically all the parishes uh, of of uh, of Kievan Rus. And then when the Mongols came in, there became this split because the metropolitan of Kiev uh was taken to moscow while a new metropolitan for the uh, for the slavs that stayed in polish Lithuanian commonwealth uh went to uh, halic and there became the split of this orthodox they were still orthodox christian but there was there was a split between who who controlled the parishes in both on the both sides of the conflict and this started basically this was part of what started this kind of uh, differentiation between these Eastern Slavs to become uh, Russians and Ukrainians and Belarusians. And even for a, for a bit, there were also Ruthenians, which were like all the way at the Western fringes of today's Ukraine, and they were called Red Russians. Um, but they later assimilated into Ukrainians and Poles. Uh, 
uh, and uh, basically that's when the divisions came. The divisions also came in in linguistics, so meaning that Polish and Lithuanian words start to be appropriated into the uh, Slavic, which was spoken in around today's Ukraine, which started to make the differences in, in language between uh, the Russians, the people around Moscow, uh, and the people in, around Ukraine. And there were various these various differences, which basically meant that once Muscovy uh, became Russia, quote unquote, uh, and conquered away the lands which are today Ukraine from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, suddenly there were these two peoples that were Slav, but they definitely saw themselves as separate. And that's basically uh, where, the, where the problems start, because the Russians were like, no, you're us. While these people that lived for almost 400 years under different uh, circumstances definitely did not see themselves as, as us. And when we say we different circumstances, they had more freedoms, right? Uh, well, that is... <laughs> that is also very very questionable so uh freedoms depending 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 so <laughs> uh, most of the nobles were lithuanian and poles there m- not many of the nobles are ukrainians ukrainians or the people who became to be ukrainians over all these differences that i talked about over the course of the centuries um uh, didn't really have much of a nobility what they did have were cossacks cossacks were a group of peoples in the 15th century that basically started to settle the lands of southern Ukraine, which were largely inhabited up until then by nomadic Turkic peoples or Mongolian peoples. And so it was a very nomadic area, very unsettled. They started settling this land and they were given a bunch of autonomy by the Polish-Lithuanian nobility because they wanted to, this land to be settled. So they were like, go there, you'll get a bunch of autonomy, tax breaks, whatever. Mm-hmm. However, these people what they started to do with their autonomy in southern Ukraine, people in western Ukraine were still under Polish control, Lithuanian control all the time uh, and were mostly peasants. But these people, these Cossacks, what they started to do was basically uh, they they got this autonomy and they're like, oh, great, uh, let's do something with it. And they started uh, basically attacking the Crimean Tatars, the Ottoman controlled uh, trading cities on the Black Sea, and then went north and started attacking the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth back. To, back to them. Even the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth saw them as part of their country. These autonomous areas as part of their country were attacking them back uh, multiple times. And there were multiple treaties between these Cossack settlements and the and the Polish-Lithuanian uh, states to try to like quell these people, pay them off, whatever. But it never really worked. Uh, and, and basically this Cossack identity then became later appropriated into the Ukrainian identity when in the 18th and 19th century. However, talking about the Cossacks as the Ukrainians would be misleading mm. yeah. uh, uh, because they were very multi-ethnic. Like they were majority Slavic, majority Slavic of the local Slavs. So what later be- what became known as Ukrainians. Uh, but uh, it was more of a style of living because they would take anyone. The, the people they raided, the Turkic nomadic people they raided, the Ottoman trading cities they raided, sometimes they'll take people with them and they will join them. Sometimes other people will come from other places that will join them. So it was very much so a multi-ethnic kind of uh, setup uh, of these uh, kind of like land pirates, honestly, in a way, uh, that, that also farmed as well. Um, and they had leaders called the Hetmanate uh, that they elected. Uh, they had elections. It wasn't a very nobility. It wasn't a very feudal system. So it was very, yeah. So that's that's basically what the Cossacks were. Uh, so that's like another thing that the Ukrainians usually appropriate into their culture, which it definitely yeah. is, but it was also very multi-ethnic. Oftentimes when we talk about it in history, all these things, think of the fact that oftentimes in history, multi-ethnic thing was a thing there wasn't really nation states or like a single ethnicity that everyone should be under that existed oftentimes yeah so can i ask a question real quick matus what so you just said that they were pretty multi-ethnic right yeah what um united them like i'm I'm assuming they not i'm assuming but like i've read that they were pretty in tune with their orthodox christian beliefs so was that like an important pillar so, of their identity, the Cossacks? So re- religion united them. That was one thing. And two, the style of living united them. Uh, right. There was a, uh, I had a great co- quote uh, 
uh, I can't find it right now. Uh, I, I'll find it later. Anyways, there was a great quote that basically said something like, the Cossacks w were united by a state of being or something like that, state of living. Right. Uh, like that was that was something that united them so, uh, as well as uh, religion. But there were there were people that were part of the Cossack settlements that had different religions, even even though mostly they were Orthodox. Uh, uh, but it was what what majorly uh, united them was this kind of autonomy, basically. Right, right, right. right. And there were men and Cossacks were not some unified group either. No, they, like no. they were distinctly. Uh, tribal in many cases, and they were also um, very geographically dispersed. You had folks all the way from like the Caucasus all the way to uh, to Ukraine, and you know some of them even started to have uh, very clear uh, ethnic uh, uh, you know divergence from the general um, Cossack identity. Uh, the Cossack was often very much like a military designation as well um especially as we get uh into like this into the uh late um russian empire and soviet times that uh cossacks were very much just like a military unit but you had groups like the khazars in uh in crimea um and stuff like that where they were very distinctly separate from Cossacks after a certain period of time to the point that Stalin literally deported all of them to uh, Siberia. Uh, so th there's just a whole lot of uh, uh, the idea of like a unified Cossack identity is it, it just not yeah. a thing. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found the quote. It was by the historian Zamoyski, and he says Cossacks were not a people or a nation, but a way of life. That was his quote. Uh, okay. And uh... If I could add, um, and this may be partially where like the Cossacks are incorporated into like the like how modern nations view their history, but like as the because it was previously mentioned, the Cossack Hetmanate kind of broke away from Poland with their autonomy. Um, Russia and Poland eventually like partitioned that area before Poland was partitioned later. Yes. And part of what would happen is when Russia would conquer these areas, for administrative purposes, the areas of the former Cossack Hetmanate were given their own, like, uh, what would be called governate in the Russian Empire. It was kind of like a, a bit more complicated than a province, but you basically had, uh, um, not Okrugs, what's the other one? Vovoychip? Like now, Vasilich? No, that that well, there, there's like the there's the administration that's basically like the equivalent of provinces, but then there were groups of those provinces that were called governates. Okay. And so, like for example, the areas of the former Hetmanate were a government, and the that, Cossack Hetmanate. I know that was called that. It was like the Russian Cossack Hetmanate. Yeah. Once What's it was basically it? absorbed into the Russian Empire, it became its own government that roughly incorporates to Ukraine and Belarus. And there was another, there were other governates of other Cossack groups for like the, what was called uh, Kuban, which is kind of like near Rostov in the Northern Caucasus Mountains and things of that nature. And later on, as like the Russian Empire broke up at the end of World War One, because of that collective uh, connection with the Cossacks, there were efforts of like some of those groups in the Caucasian Mountains to try to unify with Ukraine, trying to latch on to that Cossack identity. And it didn't end up playing out because of the Soviet Union ended up reconquering those areas anyway. But uh, a lot yeah. of those like governates of the Russian empire corresponded with what would become like the, the borders of the Soviet socialist republics and what would of course break off at the end of the Soviet Union. And when you're living under like a special district for like centuries in the Russian empire that kind of adds further to the identity of the area because they're treated differently. And so, yeah, um, to, to, to go back to how uh, the Cossack basically became part of the Hetmanet, the, the Russian Hetmanet, the Cossack Hetmanet, uh, which was kind of a vassal state in a way, uh, uh, because this is very important when it comes to, Ukrainian identity because it was uh, the, the basically that kind of the official revolution that started the Cossack revolution uh, that ended in the fact that they became part of 
uh, they became controlled by Russia was a guy named uh, Kmelnitsky. And he is very much so seen in Ukraine as like their their kind of founder because he was the guy who led the Cossack rebellion that uh, kind of went overboard. And, and lots of historians talk about how he didn't even expect it to be that big. He was just kind of... Uh, had a grudge against the Poles and wanted to like attack some cities and suddenly he was like leading this in almost an entire Ukraine of a, in, in revolution um, and uh, if Jack Rackham's watching by the way this is the man you should make another video about because his life is very interesting um, so so Kmelnitsky ran this revolution in the end he did get defeated but he still wanted to continue on so he asked uh, Ivan the fourth. Uh, of uh, Mos uh, Muscovy for help, who offered him help, and I do have I I, do, I found quotes of the official treaty, and um, Kelnitsky uh, told that I quote that Ivan the Fourth would not betray the Cossacks to the Poles, that he would not violate their liberties, and that he would confirm the rights to their land at the states of the Ukrainian Shlachta. Uh, Schlachta being like the feudal lords, because up until then, all the feudal lords were Polish and Lithuanian. So Kelnitsky wanted these like Cossack Ukrainian uh, Schlachta to be uh, in rule of that area that he rebelled with. And basically, Ivan said no. And Kel Kmelnitsky at that point was losing the rebellion so hard that he had to agree to whatever Ivan was uh giving him anyways so this was his this was what the kelnitsky want ivan said no kelnitsky anyways signed the treaty which quote unilateral which was a quote unilateral oath of obedience by the cossack hetmanet uh, so that basically created that cossack hetmanet and and that's how basically the uh the cossack hetmanet became uh, controlled by russia and later on under uh, late, later was appropriated into Russia properly. Um, uh, to so add, sorry, I was going to say, didn't uh, Poland and Russia make a treaty literally like 10 years after Kmelnitsky's uprising where they divided uh, Ukraine between them? Excuse me, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear. Sorry, I was saying, um, didn't Russia and Poland, because I'm making a video at the moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so it was this rebellion. Uh, yeah. There was this treaty. And then... It was kind of like with Texas, honestly. Then Muscovite came in and was like, Ukraine's this big. And Polish Lithuania was like, no, Ukraine's this big. And then they basically thought over how big that area was. And until it was until 1686 when they signed the eternal peace, quote unquote, which basically uh, uh, decided that the Cossack Hetmanet will be east of the Dnieper River, uh, including Kiev. Uh, so that's how, uh, that's, yeah, that's the end of that story. And that eternal peace lasted. <laughs> Ilkin, did you have something to say? I'm sorry if you got cut off. Uh, yeah, just to add uh, to the uh, Kremlinsky uprising, uh, the main reason the uprising happened was because uh, uh, Polish Lithuanian government tried to register all of the Cossacks. Uh, and as a result, uh, the idea of what they called Volnitsa, the freeland, uh, was completely uh, in peril. Obviously, they their uprising led them to uh, the same place with Russia instead of uh, Polish Lithuania. So it's uh, an interesting, like uh, historical irony, basically. Yeah, but today, basically, that rebellion in Ukrainian history is often seen as like the first Ukrainian rebellion as like trying to establish a independent state of Ukraine. I apologize. I keep pulling up uh, Wikipedia pages, but a lot of this stuff is new to the audience and me. So, uh, but yeah, so that's how you spell it there. Um, and if you want to do your own research, uh, so 1648 to 1657 is now we skipped right over the Mongols. Do we want to go into the Mongols at all or? Mm. Uh, should I, I should I through the Mongols? Wait, no. They conquered Russia during winter and they were very scary. But wait, Matus, didn't the Mongols? I know that they came and they conquered a lot, like, yeah, they forced Muscovy into submission. And I know yep. they besieged Kiev as well, I think 1240 ish. Um, but didn't they just kind of give them the power back obviously as uh, subordinates to the mongol khan in karakorum 
But yep. didn't they just like let them stay where they were? Obviously, they had to pay a tribute and everything. But it survived it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the arguments that Moscovite Russia later came with, uh, being like, we are the continuation of the Kievan Rus. Because the Kievan wow. Rus, when the Mongols came in, was fractured into these different principalities. Uh, and when the Mongols came, they did conquer them, but they did give them like autonomy as long as they would pay them tribute and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so Moscovite Russia later, when they freed themselves from uh, the Golden Horde, which were the Mongol, which was the Mongol state that succeeded, like when Mongolia uh, kind of fractured, uh, uh, they basically talked about how no, we are still Kievan Rus. Uh, that whole thing with the Mongols didn't matter. Uh, we are our directly continuation of the Rurikid dynasty all the way to Vladimir and. Uh, right. And basically, that's that's kind of the argument there that the Moscovite Russians uh, uh, were trying to persuade everyone that they have the, the direct connection to the Kievan Rus. Even though you can make the same argument with other principalities of the of the yeah. Kievan Rus. It shows the ridiculousness of modern nationalism that Russia is trying to incorporate, or Russia Russia is trying to incorporate or appropriate a piece of history that was from Kiev. Right, like it's trying to say that we are the originals. Like they can make a better argument, probably. <laughs> the evidence, the and and that, uh, another thing would be that uh, going back all the way to the early Slavs, because that's what I specialize in in my research. Uh, talking about the early Slavs as a united thing is just completely wrong, because e even the first account accounts we have of the early Slavs, six there are like no accounts that would talk about the Slavs that w that they would have some kind of kinship or ethnic identity in a way that they would fight together they were just as likely to fight with the romans against other slavs or with slavs against the romans or with goths against slavs or against each other there was there wasn't a big unity there so, so when yeah so where does the word come from slav is it an endonym or an exonym did other uh, people call them that or did they call themselves that so that's the debate currently. So uh, if you if you believe Kurta, uh, who who's a historian at the University of Florida, uh, you can read his book, The Making of the Slavs, and the book he published last year, uh, Slavs in the Making. And he basically talks of how the ethnonym Slavs was created by Byzantines and by outsiders to call these random people, and then the Slavs just appropriated it. Uh, that is a very disputed argument uh, that's very disputed at the moment and there's a lot of other slavic historians that would this dispute that and say that slav the word slav uh, comes from the word slovo which means like word or slava which means like glory that is also disputed whether it comes from one or the other uh okay. and but yeah so that is a very much disputed at the moment whether it was uh it was a thing that the slavs would use to describe people who spoke their language but not necessarily the same ethnic group uh, uh, or it was it was Byzantines that just called these people all Slavs because they were like they're all the same anyways. Yeah, because they, like, they they have yeah. like linguistic connections, but they also kind of like migrated into Europe at like different waves. So there were like what we would call like the Southern Slavs, which are like the former Yugoslavia groups. Like those kind of came uh, like around the late sixth uh, century. They, they pushed into there, and then the Avars came along, which were a different group, but then more Slavs came along, and then the Khazars came along, and then there were more Slavs. There were constantly groups moving in and out. And where, where did they come from? Where, where is like the origin uh, of Slavs? The thing to point out here is that the endonym for uh, Slavs at the time was Rus. Oh, and, uh, for, for the Eastern Slavs. And let's talk about how that became a major part of uh you know this uh, and we're very much trying to center this not on minutia about different revolts throughout the time but specifically how how uh ukrainians and russians are using this history um and so the uh we want to talk about how uh like rus versus slav was used uh, to identify whether or not you were in a group or out of a group and how that played into nationalism because nationalism ultimately is a real 19th century invention it uh, yeah. and we're talking about stuff that's way predating nationalism altogether nations basically didn't exist at least in the modern conception of it so how did this whole 
Slav versus Rus and all that kind of stuff play into um, the Russification of uh, Ukraine. Yeah, let, should we talk about Russification now? That's pr that's a yeah. pretty important. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, uh, so before people don't know, I released a couple days ago a video uh, on this topic that we're discussing right now and about about addressing Putin's historical propaganda. And, and many of the comments in that video actually didn't get the part that I was talking about when I was talking about how the Moscovite Russians appropriated the word Rus. Uh, so that entire thing, a lot of people had a hard time understanding. Maybe I didn't explain it well in the video. Fair enough. So uh, I agree we should actually address that uh, probably a bit more uh, extensively than I did in the video. Here, I'm going to plug your video. That's uh, I have not watched it yet. I feel so bad. <laughs> um, yeah. What's... Really uh, good. Okay. I'm finding it right now. I think I found right. it. Yeah. I was going to say, I, um, I've done a, a, a good amount of research into the Russification policies of uh, Alexander III and uh, Alexander II as well. But that's like the second half of the 19th century when the Russian Empire started to go to places like Poland and force them to learn Russian and blah, blah, blah. But do we know exactly what the origins of where like that impetus came from? Because if I remember correctly, like I've, I've, what I've researched about Catherine the Great, second half of the 18th century, is Russia. Uh, it seems to me that she had quite a not a fully laissez-faire attitude but like if she conquered an area she would let kind of like what Matthew said uh, at the beginning with the Cossack hetman she would let the people that were in charge there still be in charge and basically incorporate them into Russian nobility but that is like a far cry from fast forward 100 years to intense Russification of stop speaking Polish start speaking Russian do, do any of us know like when that shift kind of happened that wasn't it the 19th century, century? Yeah, that, that was the nationalism spreading across Europe in the 19th century. Okay. Which is yeah. rather interesting because Russia was actually uh, a key force in suppressing a great deal of nationalist revolts in 1848. Oh. Um, yeah, they were, <laughs> yeah. they were, and people like Catherine the Great and, um, and Peter the Great before him had actually tried to Europeanize Russia yeah. uh, significantly. Um, and this policy extended to their borderlands, as in uh, Ukraine. And the uh, the whole idea was that, you know, shave your beard, uh, speak, speak either Russian or Greek, um, and uh, really try to focus less on um uh, even though they were very much expanding eastward throughout this period getting in uh, all the way into places like alaska um they are uh, they were also trying to very much uh become part of the uh european powers as these shifting power dynamics throughout all of europe through alliances and that led to a series of um, continental wars um, ending with the uh, Seven Years' War. Um, and then eventually the Napoleonic Wars, of course, um, later on. But like the, uh, this is very much the opposite of this idea of nationalism that they were fight uh, that they started off fighting against, very literally invading Hungary, invading uh, uh, parts of what would become Germany. And um, trying to suppress these nationalist revolts, um, as opposed to in the late 19th century, they became very much a nationalist empire. Uh, well, at least trying to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the word Rus, so we can address that, I guess. Uh, okay. So, uh, whew, how far back can we go? Okay. Uh, let's just let's just start with the fact that the word Rus is describing uh, Eastern Slavs. That is the definition of the word Rus. Uh, it, it had different definitions in the past, and they get appropriated to, to mean that, but we don't have time for that. Uh, so uh, the word Rus meant the Eastern Slavs. Now, uh, by the way, when we type the word Rus, we do it R-U-S with like a little apostrophe. Oh man, he was saying such See, interesting. A little stuff. apostrophe is supposed to symbolize different. There's a difference between a soft E and a and a hard E. 
and mm. and the soft e uh, uh, is there. That means it should be pronounced as Rusi, uh, and that's where it, Russia, Russia is like even more direct, basically. But in English, no one pronounces it that way. That's why I didn't pronounce it that way in the video, and I never, I, I, I won't pronounce it now. That's just a side note there that it, that should be pronounced Rusi. Uh, uh, so uh, the Rus. Um, ever since the Kievan Rus meant all the Eastern Slavs. Now, as I said, uh, Kievan Rus was uh, a combination of multiple Eastern Slavic tribes that often didn't like each other, but were in this polity because back then feudal and, you know, uh, principal kind of vassalages and, and loyalties to your prince or lord were far more important than your ethnic uh, um, uh, like identity. Uh, but everyone saw themselves as the Rus because that's what Eastern Slavs meant. Uh, as we today use the word Eastern Slavs, they just used the word the Rus. Um, and then, basically, uh, in the future, uh, I so let's talk of, uh, let's say, 17th century when parts of Ukraine uh, east of Dnieper uh, went to the Russians uh, on, due to the uh, hetman, due to the Cossack hetmanate uh, that they kind of like vassalized. So let's say you were a, like a person going to Kiev and was like, okay, who are you? And they would say, oh, we're the Rus. And you would say, oh, like the Rus in Moscow. And they're like, no, 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 not like the Rus in Moscow. We're the Rus and the Rus in Moscow are different people. And, and uh, so they still use the word Rus because it kind of meant Eastern Slavs. It meant them. Uh, but at the same time, people would start, uh, Moscow started to say like, okay, these people are Rus, that means they're us. Whereas people that were in Ukraine were like, no. And other people that would think that they're the Rus would think they're Moscovite Rus and you don't, they didn't want that as well. They're like, no, we're different from them. So mm -hmm. that's when, uh, Ukrainians started to look for different identifiers. One of those identifiers was Cossack. They started to use Cossack far more. Another identifier was Ruthenian, which is a Latinized version of the name Rus. And another identifier was Ukrainian, which was used ever since the 12th century to describe the borderlands between Orthodox Catholic Christianity, the nomadic world, the sedentary world, basically borderlands between multiple things. Uh, and in the end, Ukraine one as that identify a word, uh, then that's why we call it Ukraine today. But uh, it was basically spurred on by the fact that Ukrainians always saw them, always, since at least uh, they were, because they were under Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth, and ever since, let's say, 15th century, 16th century, they started to see themselves as different to other Rus, they suddenly needed a different identifier, even though they would still like to call themselves the Rus, but they couldn't because there were other people that they didn't want to be identified with that used that word as well. And Moscovite Russia went to great lengths to try to use that word, and that's why Moscovite Russia became to know, known be as just Russia, which is from the word Rus, because they wanted to use that word to try to integrate all these different people that don't necessarily didn't necessarily see each other see see themselves as the Rus from Moscow. Can we talk about um, the Ukrainian language specifically? Um, th because I feel like uh, this is an easy thing for people to grasp. Like that was one of the things that was um, suppressed during the 1800s. Um, like it was banned. The Ukrainian language it couldn't be spoken in schools and stuff. And uh, how did the Ukrainian language? come to be was that was that related to this attempt to become form a separate cultural identity uh and i don't know when it began too that, that's another thing i didn't well, find it's one thing uh, one thing is there is no uh there's absolutely no close uh, nowhere close to consensus on uh where the origin of ukrainian is as with mm -hmm. most languages you don't have um you know, a definitive beginning date of, of any language. It's just kind of the the detritus of uh, of languages growing apart. But yes. uh, but even more importantly is to not think of it as some sort of defined uh, cultural affectation that like some people were trying to separate themselves from Russian or anything along those lines. It was simply a natural outcome of um, of uh, multiple Slavic people uh, 
being geographically separated. Uh, that's with all languages. While they often, while nationalists absolutely use language as a point to say that like this is a separate and distinct people that are unified by their language and all that, that's very much a 19th century affectation. The idea that a language ultimately unifies people is it, it, that's very 19th century. Um, the uh, the um, the very idea of all that. Uh, comes from Russification and that that this uh, that Ukraine is uh, is separate because of its language is is purely from that. It has more to do with the fact that um, Ukrainian nationalism arose because of na of uh, uh, Russification. I guess I'm amazed because I know that the Ukrainian language is quite a bit different than Russian, and but also today um, you look at many people in Ukraine do speak Russian. And so I just found that, I guess, interesting that, because usually you think of language as a pretty distinct uh, marker for, you know, ethnic groups. Well, they didn't define, uh, define Ukrainian as the official language of the country until 2001. So, right. it, so even, um, even until that point, uh, Ukrainian as, uh, in the beginning of their Republic, um, from 2001 to, I mean, from 1991 to 2001, even then it was still uh, contested as to whether or not uh, that would be the thing, because it's something like uh, three quarters of all uh, all Ukraine. Ukrainians actually speak Russian in yeah. daily usage. So uh, it, it's kind of like... Um, it's like here in the Southwest, you'll find that uh, a huge amount of people speak Spanish um, as a second language and you have like signage and, you know, English and Spanish. And um, sometimes you're actually kind of like expected to know a little bit of Spanish just because, uh, you know, you, you, some signs are like literally just the uh, the the hours of on a in business are sometimes only in Spanish. So you need to know that. Um, and like that's that's kind of how uh russian seems to work um in ukraine today uh, not spanish russian <laughs> it seems to work in ukraine today um as kind of like a default secondary language yeah and and basically how these things evolved uh, as cypher sets with the nationalism and stuff is that uh, when the nation states started to be a thing in like the 19th century there became this standardization of languages and and before then you had like a language continuum so you know people from one town next to the town will understand each other but suddenly if you go from like one corner of ukraine to like northern russia it, even though they still speak eastern slavic it's going to be completely different they coincided with the development of the railroad for sure um, yeah, yeah so so like these things where you would like understand town to town and then further you go apart it's going to be much harder and harder to understand that's yeah. called the language continuum and when the standardization of languages became a thing in 19th century with the nation states uh, people started to standardize language for their specific nation state um uh, that's when like these harder borders start to be drawn between where a certain kind of standardized language is taught and a different kind of standardized language is taught. So suddenly you don't have that gradient of a continuum, but you have those like harder borders. This can be perfectly seen actually in France, where when the French Revolution started, only around 12 million people could speak French, only like people around Paris and like northern France, whereas like southern French people spoke a Latin, like a Roman Romanesque language, but like it was Akitan or like it was at Basque or something, not, not Basque, that's not it, Latin, but like it was like a different, different, like a different Latin language, different Romance language, and they couldn't understand Parisian French. And it was only after France started to like standardize their French and started to teach it all across France that suddenly this like hard divide of language became a thing. It's also not just a, you know, somebody, ah, my cat is attacking me. Um, but uh, the the um, it's not just that you know France or or even Russia it was solely pushing this kind of standardization from the top down. It was also just things like the printing press being able to standardize uh, the way people read and therefore um, standardize uh, pronunciations around uh, the written word. Um, once you have 
uh, rising levels of literacy, you see that uh, you'll see that uh, li uh, linguistic change becomes slower. Um, it's a lot easier to understand somebody in English from 1920 as opposed to now, as opposed to somebody who was in 1920 trying to understand somebody from 1820. Um, the the difference in in linguistic change has has slowed because of techno uh, of technology right and like a lot of those standardizations especially for languages like russian continued into the 20th centuries because like lenin for example even had a reform of the russian language where he just flat out got rid of like four or five letters of the cyrillic alphabet mm -hmm. you know, that was like the 20s so like even as late as that they were still standardizing and Ukrainian still has one of them, if I remember correctly. Yes, I think so. I can't remember which one now. So I think we should go ahead and look at um, the independence movement of the early 1900s um, and, you know, the Russian Civil War, and um, which many people don't realize uh, was also um, the end of, like the Ukrainian War of Independence. And so um, can anyone speak to that significance? I already talked well, about anyone wants to take that. <laughs> uh, well, I've actually done some some actual historical work on on the Russian Civil War, though very much from a very different side, uh, from the interventionist side. Uh, but the uh, but um, one of the things that uh, that Russia was trying to do in the middle of the uh, Civil War was just kind of stop from falling apart. Right, the uh, the um, entirety of Russia. Uh, so, for instance, in um, early 1918, um, interventionist forces actually held more of Russia than the Bolsheviks did, um, and you know, the, uh, not early 19, mid 1918, I should say. It's like August and September. Um, by that point, the the Bolsheviks seemed to be just completely collapsing. Um, and the uh, and the interventionist forces are managing to to eat them from the uh, east and the west, but um, from the uh, I mean from the uh, from the east and the north, but from the west you have um, the Germans coming in and uh, having taken so much territory up until the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which you can see on screen here is uh, is it shows the actual territory and the little kind of. Uh, dash mark that was signed away in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which is pretty much the entirety of Ukraine. And then once uh, once the uh, once the uh, German Empire falls apart in the latter part of 1918, um, uh, Ukrainian people uh, start seeing an opportunity because there's been this buildup of, of nationalism in opposition to Russification and that in the late 19th century and early, late 19th and early 20th century to the point that they start trying to create their own republics. And there's several different ones that try this. I mean, there's even an, an anarchist republic at one point. Uh -huh. uh, and and it, it's like uh, just this, uh, they're, they're doing the best they can with just all this craziness coming and the heels of World War One, and so um, one of the biggest ones, the Ukrainian Socialist Republic, I think it's uh, if I remember the name correctly, um, manages to actually unify a good chunk of what is Ukraine today. Um, and uh, but the but this is the point when interventionist forces in Russia are are really stepping back. White Russians are starting to really be beaten in. Uh, late 1919 and early uh, 1920 and so they so the russians start looking westward to try to reconquer some of that uh some of that imperial land that they used to uh, that they used to have that the rsfsr um is now trying to incorporate into some unified state of socialist republics a union of soviet socialist republics you could say uh but the 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 attempt on this was not simply you know they marched in and took it it took years of war for uh, and uh trotsky spent a good chunk of his time as uh as the uh, uh minister of defense no minister of war um 
going after these things, trying to go as far west as Poland and Hungary, um, sweeping through Ukraine with overwhelming force once they were able to do so. But um, this is a very complicated history, but you can also see that Ukraine itself is very much trying to be separate, um, but not being allowed to simply because they have an empire that, well, I mean, they're not going to call themselves an empire, but they're functioning as one, um, sweeping in and controlling them through occupation and basically reformulating that socialist republic into a Soviet socialist republic um, that is more something that they can unify to create the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. Um, so the uh, that they... W were kind of created as a separate country, but it wasn't just as Putin would like to say, some uh, some uh, creation of Lenin by mistake or something like that. It was a hard fought separation, um, and it's really disingenuous to to pretend that that war didn't happen. And uh, I can add this because I literally just finished mapping this out a few days ago. <laughs> Basically, you had what was called the Ukrainian People's Republic, which broke away as its own country, and it kind of allied itself with the white Russian forces for sake of not wanting to be Bolshevik. Then the Brest-Litovsk Treaty was signed, and then the Germans came in and used that state as an occupied puppet state called the Ukrainian state, and then the, the communists formed the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in uh, Kharkiv, which is why Kharkiv was actually the Soviet capital of Ukraine up until the 30s before they moved it back to Kiev. And then the Ukrainian People's Republic came back after the Germans left, and then the Poles came in, and the Soviets and the Poles kind of squeezed them in the middle, and then they fought each other back and forth over Ukraine until 1922 when the Soviet Union finally uh, formed and they signed a treaty with Poland. And, and that was and all, of course, like five years. Yeah. And there were also independent Ukrainian socialist factions, which did were in Bolshevik. Yeah. And then like the, the anarchist faction that like cycle that, yeah. that was in like, uh, that was actually in the Donbass area, if I remember right. I had no idea. Uh, about around, that. Yeah. Around that area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and one of the interesting things is uh, uh, one of Trotsky's main uh, methods of warfare was to basically gather up troops as much as possible and use the rails to um, take over a major region. Um, and this is exactly how he conquered Ukraine. And an interesting parallel to what's going on right now is that they're literally using armored trains again. It's just, it's fascinating that th that is literally what uh what trotsky did so um yeah we'll uh, see how that goes but the uh <laughs> the fact is that um it was very much an invading force that had to create this this uh this uh ukrainian social soviet socialist republic not to be confused with the other ussr <laughs> right, right, right. but it was a part of the ussr you can um, and officially created in uh, 1922, once they had full control of the area, but uh, and unified in 1925. I can't remember when the actual treaty was created, but the uh, somewhere around there. And um, huh, 22. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the this kind of set up a stable regime for a little bit. Um, but that was purely under the, uh, the liberalization that, uh, Lenin brought in called the, uh, new economic plan, the NEP, uh, and this is a broad, uh, this basically, uh, liberalized the, uh, the Soviet economy for a little bit as kind of like a temporary form of capitalism to get the socialism beginning. The people who came, became rich were known as net men, um, but some of them were, uh, especially if they were agricultural, uh, landowners became known as Cossacks uh, and, um, uh, I mean, Kulaks. Dang it, <laughs> call it kulaks, uh, and the uh, because even though the term kulak actually goes back centuries, the uh, the 
the uh, idea of kulaks that we have today in terms of needing to de Ukraine came in the late 1920s um, because of the net men um, and other people who had uh, become powerful because of Nyep. Um, now, the interesting thing with um, with Kulaks is that they were also um, typically uh, very small landowners, not not like big capitalists as they were often portrayed. But when Stalin became gen, well, he was general secretary, and then there's this power struggle that happens in the late 1920s. But as he becomes powerful, especially through the Cultural Revolution of 1929, the uh, he starts instituting a dekulakization de policy, which mm, yeah. uh, very much targets Ukraine. Um, here I'll pull that and, up. And uh, Ooh, this is. Too. It's uh yeah you could just type in dekulakization. Is this um, not current? Is this something Koronizatia, else? That's that's Lenin's approach towards like state building. We can talk about that later as well. Okay. Yeah, there's so there was uh, there's multiple ideas of the USSR as a, what's called a multi-ethnic empire. Um, there's a great article literally called uh, like. Uh, Lenin's uh, Les Lenin's Soviet Union as a multi-ethnic empire. I think is the name of the article. Um, could pull it up if uh, we want to go through that. But the the main idea of that is that there was multiple eth uh, uh, ethnic identities that they tried to uh, unify under socialism, um, but uh, keep you know cultural stuff separate. Stalin, when he comes to power, is very different, and is uh, he literally starts with a cultural revolution in 1929, um, very much targeted at these kinds. Uh, it's not just Ukraine that he's targeting; he's t uh, Cossacks and, uh, and um, Tatars. Not, yeah, uh, like all uh, basically all the many many ethnic identities throughout the USSR. Um, but dekulakization ended up really targeting uh, Ukraine to the point that um, a lot of kulaks uh, uh, who were, you know, just petty landowners um, started kind of building up a rebellion there. And when the uh, famine struck, the, the, a famine throughout the Soviet Union in the, the early 1930s, um, these kula, uh, this kind of Resistance to dekulakization in that um, had had really uh, angered Stalin. So guess what he does in terms of moving grain around the entire USSR? He yeah. takes it away from the breadbasket to uh, and uh, often mismanages it to, uh, and it gets to no one, ending up killing around three million people in the process. This is called the uh, Holodomor. Maybe uh, as much as twelve million. <laughs> Well, that that would probably be referring to the entire Soviet uh, uh, famine of uh, 1933 uh -huh. through 34, but uh, it's it's very important. Uh, this is a very important part of uh, defining a separate ethnic identity uh, mm -hmm. uh, within the USSR of Ukrainians, because the Holodomor very much targets Ukraine, and it's part uh, partly built on this resistance to dekulakization in that. Um, so the, uh, this entire thread from 1917 all the way until 1934 comes through this, uh, from, you know, trying to create separate republics then being taken over, then Nyep, then Kulaks and Kul dekulakization, and then finally the Holodomor, um, all go through this, this, uh, this kind of, um, national crisis within Ukraine that they start that they really see themselves as separate um, which is quite the opposite of how uh, Putin has been trying to portray this period yeah and and to, to talk about a bit on Koronizatsia it was basically kind of like Lenin's plan uh, so right after well after the Soviet Union was uh, created Lenin had this idea that nations, uh, quote, nations were important in the current junction, but ultimately secondary. 
but they were important in the current junction. And and therefore he initiated this like plan Koranizatia, which means like indigenation. So a lot of like the separate republics like Ukraine ha- had uh, a lot of like le- had a lot of autonomy when it came to like cultural and linguistic laws and stuff like that. So they could promote a lot of their own um, own like cultural ideas and, and even national national ideas. Uh, and so, uh, uh, for example, a lot of uh, books and like even historical writings about Ukrainian history came from like the 1920s uh and then when stalin came to power he very much so reversed that and and uh came in with his purges and i have a a very good story to symbolize this entire thing um that i found just today uh reading uh what did i read alexei miller the ukrainian question so you want to read that book a good book so like in the 1920s uh, the first ever history book about the history of the russian policy towards ukrainians or like all of it since the moscovite russians uh it was written by a historian called shavchenko with the help of other historians in the ukrainian academy of sciences led by a man named grushevsky and they were basically working under this koronizatsia rule which lenin implemented they were like writing about their own ukrainian history and they wrote it during the process of colonization, and they wrote it in a very big hurry because Savchenko, who wrote the book, very much so knew that this would probably not last, and he was correct because even though he published the book in the ni- in the late 1920s, in 1934, Savchenko, along with Grushevsky and all the other colleagues that helped him write this book and wrote other history books about Ukrainian history, were rounded up by Lenin by on lenin's uh, orders and sent to gulags and later executed in 1937 along with many other ukrainian intellectuals that promoted in one way or another ukrainian national identity during this koronizatsia uh uh, so so there was this stark kind of uh going back with stalin being like no we're centralizing power we're ending all those kind of like nationalistic laws that helped people Uh, in ukraine but in also the republics kind of create their own uh like not create but like emphasize more their own national identities and we're going back to like more russification laws um so uh, i wanted to uh, that's what yeah it doesn't go away go ahead elkin what uh, regarding colonization uh obviously it may sound uh easy to understand but uh look at it from the ukrainian perspective uh Colonization was uh, implemented to uh, everyone in the USSR to some extent. But uh, when your language and your religion is different from the uh, language and religion of the uh, center, it's easier for you to keep your identity. Uh, Like, uh, I'm from Azerbaijan. Obviously, colonization happened in Azerbaijan too. Uh, but because the language was different and because the religion was different, it was uh, much more difficult to uh, russify the Azerbaijanians versus the Ukrainians. Uh, and the second point regarding Stalin's uh, uh, movement uh, back to centralization of USSR, it's true, uh, obviously, and uh, it was fueled by his uh, dictatorial ambitions, let's say. But uh, it's also important to mention that uh, there was some backtracking during the Second World War. Uh, the national identities of Ukrainians and other peoples was kind of underlined. Uh, for instance, Khmelnytsky returned into the public eye uh, during the Second World War, uh, like books about him, stories about him, etc. because Stalin was trying to imply uh, that Ukrainians, when fighting against Germans, are also fighting for their own uh, identity, in a way. Uh, So uh, part of uh, national identity of Ukrainians was actually revived uh, in the 40s because of that. And, you know, when you talk about the terror famine, uh, this is not something that's going to be erased from memories. You know, this is the stories told from parents to children, to grandparents to grandchildren, that these carried on <laughs> and you think about such a traumatic event on this region of the world, the wor- the part of the world that we forget is one of the biggest agriculture producers in the world and t- talk about geography and uh, interlinked with um, identity. 
I mean, it's, it's the breadbasket of, um, it was the breadbasket of the entire Soviet Union and even of the world today. It's still agriculture is such a big part of their identity, uh, very similar to where I live here in the middle of the, well, Emperor Tiger Star too. You know, we understand how big, a big part of, <laughs> there's a lot of pride in um, especially being able to be self-sufficient and then to have that taken away, literally. It's I mean, also why they have yellow in their flag. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important thing to bring up. So you're, you're more closer to like the plains and the farmland. I'm technically on a plateau. So I was going to say, Matt, you, I think you made a brilliant point about uh, like uh, Ukrainians not forgetting the pain of the Holodomor, because mm -hmm. if we're talking about nationalism, that's one theme that really does, uh, it can unite people. And, you know, like things that hurt stay with you. It's, you know, there's loads of those sayings uh, you're supposed to forgive. Um, wanting revenge is like drinking your own poison, stuff like that. But it's very natural. natural. Drama. Yeah, exactly. But it's very, it's very natural to like hang on to all of that stuff. So and when it comes to things like national identity, I mean, we only need to look at like Jews, Armenians with the Armenian genocide, how integral that is to their own identity as a group. So, I mean, uh, like, even when you talk to Ukrainians nowadays, I don't think there would be a Ukrainian that doesn't know about the Holodomor. Yeah. Yeah, especially because there, there, we also have to uh, point out that it's actually a big part of of Russian nationalism nowadays to uh, deny the Holodomor. Um, mm -hmm. And there was actually very much a cover-up during the, uh, the time frame, which... Interestingly enough, American journalists are heavily implicated in this. In this, uh, is basically trying to downplay um, the, the absolute mismanagement of of Ukrainian grain, um, basically as a form uh, as an attempt to 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 stop this kind of um, Ukrainian resistance in that, and instead make it about how, oh, well, this is just the natural part of a famine, you know, it's uh, the entire Soviet Union is in a famine right now, and and it's like, well, no, not, not Ukraine. <laughs> Ukraine is also part of a union, not supposed to be a, 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 sep a, it's supposed to be a separate state in 1934. But, um, you know the USSR never really functioned as separate states and more as a centralized uh, bureaucracy, but the uh, the um, that because Holodomor kind of just translates to uh, to um, fire famine or sometimes terror famine. Um, because I it don't was think that's true. Uh, Golet means hunger and more means famine, uh, death uh, from the illness, actually. So uh, a, famine and it illness. Was Latin based. Uh, no, it's Russian, Golet and more. Uh, so uh, uh, hunger and illness. Okay. But yeah. the, uh, the, the, um, th it was very much targeted at Ukraine, and um, Ukrainians today very much remember that, but Russians will try to downplay it. I'm pretty sure I saw some people in the comments trying to downplay it, because it's very much a tanky thing that they like to uh, play, uh, uh, to pretend that, you know, Russia could do no wrong. And um, this is a very clear instance of that, and Ukrainians never forgot it. And shout out to Casual Historian, who has a uh, great video, probably multiple videos uh, on the topic, if you want to research more. And some of those comments underneath his video, just what you're talking about there, Cypher. <laughs> uh, do we want to jump ahead to, I mean, anything else about World War II era, um, what was going uh, on with Ukraine? Well, or, we, we haven't gone really, to World yeah, War II we, yet. <laughs> We were oh, talking nineteen thirties. Well, but... kind of hinted a little bit, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I want to move things along here. So let's uh, let's jump up ahead to. I, I guess bit. one thing to mention is that during this entire time, uh, Lviv and like what is today Western Ukraine were part of Poland uh, at the time. Uh, so this there entire were... time there wasn't even through. So like th there was the West Ukrainian oh. People's Republic, which rebelled with the Ukrainian People's Republic, and they tried to unite, but it never happened. And then. 
uh, Poland basically conquered them and that entire area was controlled by Poland until uh, the end of the Second World War. Well, yep. not during the Second World War because Nazis came in, but yeah, you, you get the point. Uh, the West before, before World War One, before World War One is part of Russia, correct? No, before World War One, uh, the, the area that is in the interwar period part of Poland was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, and it's no, important I'm, to like, point out that a good chunk yeah, of yeah. what is Ukraine became part uh, be, uh, became part of Ukraine because of uh, the treaty, uh, the uh, pact between uh, the the uh, oh, what's it called the Warsaw Molotov Pact. Ribbentrop co uh, Compact of uh, that basically yeah. divided Poland, um, oh. and and uh, essentially the uh, the Russians incorporated. A chunk of that into um, Ukraine, their uh, their uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Right. Um, so the uh, that that whole eastern chunk of Ukraine was part of Poland until western. that. Uh, oh, sorry, Western. <laughs> uh, it's hard to keep all this. Stuff yeah, up. no worries, no worries. Happens. Um, it's on the other side of the world. You you always have to mirror it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but the uh, the um uh that was part of that, and a, a very often forgotten part of that whole Molotov Ribbentrop Compact was that the Russians invaded Poland as well, <laughs> um and took over a good chunk of Poland, and that's how Ukraine got that western part. Um, so. Lviv and um, and uh, the area around it are um, kind of awkwardly separate, um, but then uh, that's also an artifact of um, the of World War One and how Poland got created, mostly because of well, we shall not mention his name. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes, Woodrow yeah. Wilson. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, Poland, as uh, as it was after World War One, was created because of the Treaty of Versailles, and um, the uh, that huge chunk of Ukraine, as we can see here in yellow, um, became part of Ukraine. Um, so Ukraine gained from this, but then eventually the Nazis turned around and Germany attacked. Uh, um, attacked Russia under uh, in what's called Operation Barbarossa um, and basically swept through this region all the way to uh, um, to uh, I'm forgetting what it's called now it's not called Stalingrad now but it was called hey, Stalingrad Volgograd is what it's called now Volgograd yeah um, oh it's and they true. swept through here. And so this becomes a really traumatizing um, part of Ukrainian history as well, because they, some of them end up becoming partisan, uh, pro-German partisans. Some of them end up, uh, you know, fighting against Germany as partisans, but then uh, kind of fighting against Soviets as partisans. And the Russians, on the other hand, remember this as the Great Patriotic War. Um, it becomes this kind of like thing about solidarity and and patriotism that um, and yet you, in Ukraine it's very different. You have so many different sides to it, um, and this is actually pretty key to understanding Putin's rhetoric about denazification, because up until this point it was very common for uh, I mean up until this point and well after it. Um, even to today, uh, which is kind of the part of the problem, is that they portrayed that anything in the West was Nazi or fascist or anything along those lines. That it literally just um, a lot of Russian propaganda had to do with just portraying any kind of capitalism as um, as fascist. Now there was a period known uh, the. Unified Front. I am mi mixing up names now. Uh, the uh, Unified Front. I forgot what it's called. Where they actually try to deal with more liberal capitalist countries, such as the U.S. 
um, and create a unified front against fascism. But that was a very short period of time between uh, 1938 and um, 41. Um, but besides that, that period of time, um, and of course the war itself, outside of it, they were very conscientiously portraying anything Western as um, Nazi or, uh, or uh, fascist. And that's very much what Putin means by denazification. A lot of Western media likes to point out actual neo-Nazis within um, Ukrainian militias and that, but there's actually a heck of a lot more neo-Nazis in Russia than there are in Ukraine. Um, and the fact is, he's not talking about that. He's he's bringing up that old rhetoric around the Great Patriotic War, where you had Ukrainians who were not exactly on one side or the other, and then they ended up having to sweep through there and take back Ukraine. So this this is actually very key to understanding what, what Putin is trying to say, um, is that he's not really talking about, like, actual Nazis. He's talking about just the West. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point there. Um, anything else to say about the, the great patriotic war or the, uh, world war two era? I think, uh, uh, M. Laza made a good point in his recent video. Uh, Despite the fact that I dislike him uh, very much, whoa! Uh, <laughs> video, you said something nice. The, the video was very nice. I, I thought it was very good. Uh, even uh, we had we wanted to make some kind of video of this type, but uh, of, on this topic. And uh, now I feel like uh, everything that needs to be said was said, so uh, we don't need to say anything. Uh, the point is that. Uh, not everyone within the Soviet Union uh, liked to be in the Soviet Union. Uh, because of that, uh, there were dozens of different legions, as they were called. There was Armenian Legion, Azerbaijan Legion, Georgian Legion. Uh, there was a, a Russian Liberation Army under General Vlasov. Uh, and there was Ukrainian Insurgent Army under uh, Bandera. So uh, this... Uh, Armies obviously served uh, the interest of Germany in this war. So, uh, and it's not a hidden knowledge that uh, almost every country in Europe have some kind of version of them. So, uh, obviously, uh, we need to understand where Ukraine is coming from in this regard. We need to understand that. Um, I don't want to go too deep into ideological. Um, fight here but in order to have a state you need to have some kind of national identity uh for ukraine uh this national identity started forming later than for other european nations like uh i think a uh, cynical historian mentioned it uh, that in 19th century many european nations went through this na uh, nationalism period well ukraine never did so uh it's easier to understand why uh, uh, Bandera has more influence over the Ukrainian self-identity than, uh, let's say, Vlasov over the Russian one. Because uh, Ukraine formation of the Ukrainian identity took longer and it was more difficult. So obviously we'll come to Bandera, we'll talk about Azov and uh, other stuff. But in general, uh, uh, it, it's needs, it needs to be understood that uh, these armies existed all over Europe. Uh, every one of them has their own internal goals. Overall, they all serve the German goals. Uh, but uh, these internal goals are very important to the national identity of the Ukrainians and others too. Yes, very good points. Um, do we want to briefly mention the uh, the partisan groups that were that, that the West was supporting um, against the Soviet Union into the 1950s? All right, guys, before you get into this, uh, I'm going to have to love you and leave you. It was a pleasure joining you guys. Yes. Um, I'm going to watch the rest of this another time. Uh, I have to go now. Yes. Good night to you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Tariq. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. All right. We'll see you. See you.
something I'd like to point out it, it, it um, because this is another part of Russian propaganda is that uh, that you know somehow all the partisan groups were supported by the CIA and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> which one, CIA didn't even exist until 1947. Uh, but two, the uh, th- there's only one group that was really. Uh, pushed by the CIA and uh, actually more in particular MI6, which was Polish uh, partisans um, after the after the war. And yes, there was very much uh, CIA support of that, but not really in Ukraine. While there were uh, while there were partisans in Ukraine that lasted well into the 50s, um, especially in the cast. The, I can never say that right. The, the mountains. Carpathians. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So th- those mountains. <laughs> I'm going to try to say it. Um, Carpathians? Uh, <laughs> anyways, those mountains. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, of um, partisan groups, that, which are basically just guerrilla fighters um, that continue to resist uh, uh the Soviets for a long time into the fifties, but otherwise they weren't, they were pretty much melded back into society fairly quickly. Um, after the war though, Stalin did have uh, a couple of purges because of that. And we should also mention the purge of Crimea, which while Crimea was not part of Ukraine at this point, that was a, that was given to Ukraine by uh, Khrushchev later on. But, um, as kind of a continuance of that whole Russification thing. You had all those Khazars in, um, in Crimea um, who Tata's, had... Tatas, not Khazars. Yeah, Khazars are a very different group. Oh, sorry. Crimean Ta- Tatas, yeah. <laughs> Tatars, yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, Turkic, Turkic people. Turkish yeah. speaking people, yeah. Um, and they got uh they were um mass deported after the war um and from uh late 1945 to uh early 1947 most tatars were um removed from crimea altogether um which at for a while an entire uh uh emirate had had been uh, uh, focused on uh, Crimea and that had later been melded into the uh, into the Russian Empire and so this was a remnant of that and then they just completely removed it um, sent them to Siberia and literally to gulags um, and uh, this is yet another national trauma that uh, Ukraine has and that uh, that Russians tend to just uh, not I shouldn't say Russians that Russian leaders yeah. um, tend to uh, completely ignore in order to postulate that, you know, cr- uh, Ukraine is not a real country and Crimea rightfully belongs to them and so on and so forth. The uh, A lot of comments that I saw about Crimea on my video where people just having the stupidest arguments, but I'll explain them because I think it's kind of relevant here. And it's that there is talking about it's like okay, the Crimean Tatars aren't there anymore. But what about the um, what about the Goths that were there before them, or what about the Greeks that were there before them, or what about the Samaritans that were there before them? And and that's I feel like that's kind of another thing that the Russian propaganda is pushing right now. Like oh, this has always happened in the Crimea. Like it's just another iteration of like pushing out people. Remember uh, everyone, two wrongs make a right, and that's how the saying goes. Yeah, yeah, it's just... Uh, regarding uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, so just to give some kind of uh, perspective, uh, something like 30 to 50% of the entire population was moved to Kazakhstan, and uh, something like uh, 100k uh, died there, and uh, only very few returned. Uh, Again, I understand that uh, we want to give the land back to the gods or whatever, whoever they are. I don't care. But uh, jokes aside, uh, this is a re- this is a real people uh, who uh, were able to only return to Crimea in uh, something like sixties and seventies, in diminished numbers, and uh, they still carry this 
national trauma with them. I personally know a few uh, Crimean Tatars. And so uh, when the ethnic uh, reasoning is used for the Russian invasion, it should be understood that uh, many areas in Ukraine, uh, mainly uh, Crimea, was populated by the Russians uh, due to this ongoing genocide. Uh, I I can probably never understand uh, people, especially leftists, uh, who can talk about these events in terms of national identity, can accept the fact that Putin basically said that uh, he's trying to uh, get uh, buffer space for Russian people, whatever it's, it's called, and then go on and uh, claim that Ukraine is controlled by the Nazis. This is uh, pure propaganda. This is nothing else than that. And uh, this is the fact that there are people who accept that is truly disgusting to me. Yes, that's that's why we're talking about it right now. At least that's. Thank you for the yeah, talk. Uh, I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, and we haven't even got anywhere near to <laughs> uh, modern day yet. So. <laughs> Um, I say uh, let's move ahead to uh, the Cold War period. Um, we mentioned Crimea was given to Ukraine by Khrushchev. Um, maybe talk about the, uh, do we want to talk about the um, influx of Russian migrant workers to Ukraine? Anything to talk about there or is that, I saw that. Uh, oh, sure? I just realized I was muted. You're muted there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was going to say, let's let's first talk about how the creation of buffer states, as in the Eastern Bloc, and how that yeah. affected Ukraine, and very much led to this whole uh, influx of workers and everything, because um, the taking back of Ukraine and the, this whole uh, partisan movement was uh, especially helped along by the fact that they were that the Soviet Union swept uh, westward for, uh, during World War II and took over basically all of Eastern Europe, all, uh, all the way to Germany. Um, you know, they were the first in Berlin and everything. And so they um, basically turned a lot of uh, those Eastern uh, those Eastern European countries into um, a buffer state, between, uh, buffer states between th the USSR and uh, and um, you know, the West, and this is known as the Eastern Bloc. As we can see here, this is, uh, people get really angry about this. Uh, we have to point out that Yugoslavia eventually did not become, was no longer part of the Eastern Bloc, but it was as of 1948. Um, seriously, people get really angry about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the, you can see here that you know, Poland, Czechoslovakia was overthrown in a coup in 1947. Uh, Hungary and Romania were created as as uh, puppet states. Uh, I can't really speak to Bulgaria um, or Moldova, but uh, the the um, the Baltic states uh, were especially hurt because they were taken over because of the. Uh, because of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Compact. And this gives a huge amount of territory that, uh, while not technically being part of the USSR, is virtually controlled by the USSR, partially by puppet states and alliances, and eventually brought in under the Warsaw Pact as a response to NATO. Um, all of this, of course, affects Ukraine. Um, as you can see, right there in the middle of all of it. Um, and the most southerly part of the USSR that actually um, abuts all of this, uh, this Eastern Bloc. So when they need to move people around because, well, those, that Eastern Bloc's getting a bit troublesome, um, guess where they end up going through? So mm -hmm. the creation of the Eastern Bloc absolutely affects um, Ukraine. There for the um, Yugoslavia folks. There you go. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if you actually go back to the other map, because like you, you mentioned, like buffer states with like the creation of the Eastern Bloc, but they even still expanded land onto Ukraine after the war as well. They kept the 1939 partition borders, and then they uh, took Ruthenia, which was 
it's kind of contested between like Hungary and Czechoslovakia, but they basically just gave it to Ukraine. And then Moldova became like a Soviet socialist Republic by taking that from Romania. And then they gave like the Southern, like third of Bessarabia as the territory was called like to Ukraine proper, which is kind of the area that's like Southwest of Odessa. So like, even even aside from buffer states, they are still like giving more land to the actual Soviet Union in Ukraine. And yeah. I think uh, we haven't even really brought up the Black Sea much, uh, the strategic importance of it. Um, Odessa as a port city and like it's something that Russia or the Soviet Union, Stalin, all leaders following him always um, highly valued. So um I think that their their presence there, I think, was always pretty heavy in terms of like for trade. You know, the, let me get a bit better map maybe for the Black Sea, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the Black Sea was important, especially early on to the Russian Empire because it was their first warm sea port, uh, whereas all the northern ports used to freeze over in the winter. Exactly. Yeah, it's just, maybe I'll try this. Although St. Petersburg was kind of a warm port ish. Even that one, they had to literally build up from a swamp of nothing into a city in yeah. the place. So. And, you know, some of the, it's, the, some of the bodies are still buried in the bay. But, uh, yeah, like, um, but it was, uh, uh, but that's in the Baltic rather than the uh, Black Sea. And the Black Sea is a key uh, trade port um because you have access to a whole bunch of different countries through it and it's um fairly easy to navigate through the uh dardanelles and um and the uh whatever the uh, one north of there is bosphorus. but <clears throat> bosphorus thank you um <laughs> always rely on the map guy to know all the names <laughs> um the uh, but like once you get through there, then you have access to the Mediterranean, and uh, so it's an incredible trade port. It's it has military advantage. Uh, back in the Crimean War, um, obviously focusing on Crimea, um, because Sevastopol right there, like um, right where you were circling on the uh, on it's not an island on the uh, peninsula. Uh, yeah, right there is Sevastopol, and um, that's a major. Uh, 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 they, the Western powers besieged it for two years, um, trying to take it uh, to um, be able to really force Russia to come to the table and negotiate. So, it, like going all the way back to the 1850s, this uh, Crimea has been an absolutely essential strategic. Um, part of uh, of the Russian Navy and that. So um, and it, it, that's still today. Um, there's been a significant buildup in Sevastopol of the Russian Navy since 2014 when they took over. So the uh, the Black Sea absolutely is a huge um, part of uh, why they want Ukraine because that's gives them so much more access to. It rather than just their tiny little port in uh, in uh, where the Volga comes at. And the choke point in the Bosporus around Istanbul is one of the many, many reasons why Russia and Turkey are always butting heads. Yeah. Uh, this map is from 1989, by the way. Um, and that's kind of uh, <laughs> the beginning of the end uh, for the Soviet Union. Uh, that's next up on on our our uh, list to look at here. But do we want to say anything else about the the Cold War in relation to Ukraine before we look at the fall of the Soviet Union? Mm, I, I guess the only thing would be like trying to set up the fall of the Soviet Union in the context of the Cold War, being that we already talked about the migrant workers into the in, industrializing cities of Ukraine, which were often Russian speaking. Uh, and then the centuries of Russification meant that Russian as a language was quite prolific in Ukraine by the time uh, the USSR broken up. Uh, one interesting note uh, that might be interesting in uh, regards to Putin's claims that Ukraine is not a real country. Uh, when the UN was just getting set up, 
uh, USSR, Stalin tried to get uh, Ukraine and Belarus as uh, separate states into the UN uh, in order to boost the numbers of uh, communist states. So uh, at least Stalin was seeing Ukraine as real, I guess. That's my point. Yeah, they, they also use that as a counter to like the British making Canada, Australia, and New Zealand like their own parts of the League of Nations in the United Yeah, United Australia is not real. We know that. <laughs> I mean, have you seen New Zealand ever on a map? No, it's never there. <laughs> I guess like, a, I I guess like, a, like another thing you can add with the Cold War is that because of like the, the resuming of uh, Russification after uh, World War II, you have a lot of place names in ukraine like you'll you'll notice they may have multiple names and like the russian name was like the more commonly used name during like the cold war so like kharkiv was called kharkov and that's where you see kiev versus kiev and and things like that um not to mention khrushchev aside from giving them crimea during uh mm -hmm. stalinization there were a lot of uh regions cities and towns that were named after Stalin or members of Stalin's uh, inner circle that were renamed a dozen times back and forth before and after Stalin. So I guess that's a, another minor thing. So if you ever see something old that says like Kharkov instead of Kharkiv, that's why. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important on this period to remind everyone that uh, the reason why we all might remember calling Ukraine the Ukraine is because, uh, you know, at the time it was called the Ukraine internationally and it wouldn't, uh, I think it's 2011 is when they uh, officially requested to be called Ukraine rather than the Ukraine. Um, and this is very much a remnant of this period where um, the USSR treated Ukraine as a, as a continuance of their Russian empire from b before they were a Soviet Republic. Um, and that goes back to the term the borderlands. Um, that's why people would say the, but the reason why we don't say that anymore and the reason why Ukraine petitioned to uh, to get it officially changed and everything, and uh, like especially in uh, em uh, in embassies and whatnot, um, was to uh, to stop being treated as a borderland of Russia. So um, th that comes from this period that uh, that even th then when people were talking about the ukraine um as a place they would always use that article in front of it as a designator of it being owned by russia mm. okay yeah i had no idea about that <laughs> um so broader i had a roommate that got really angry with me one time <laughs> oh your, your roommate from ukraine yeah, yeah. um I, I lived with a roommate from ukraine for three years and uh I learned not to say the Ukraine. <laughs> you sound like an idiot. Yeah, I, my middle, one of my middle school teachers, uh, he wasn't from Ukraine, but he basically like did a study thing and he lived there for like 15 years, basically. And like he, he, he like, I don't want to say he beat it into me, but you know, like every single time, like, no, Ukraine, not the Ukraine. <laughs> Regarding the uh, the thing, it's kind of worse in uh, Russian. Uh, in Russian, when you say uh, that you are going somewhere, you are using in. Uh, I am in US, for instance. Uh, but for Ukraine, you use on, like it's uh, not a country, but rather uh, something like an island or a, a peninsula. And this is uh, always creates a, uh, like a tension between uh, the Russian speakers, especially if you are pro, pro or against Ukraine. So uh, there are many different uh, linguistic problems stemming from that. All right. Uh, so broader speaking, I think it's important to um, when we look at Ukraine, it's in the fall of the, the Soviet Union. Um, I think all of them kind of felt it the same way. This is something I'm a little bit more comfortable talking about, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. 
Um, but overall, I mean, there's different arguments as to what caused the the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there's multiple um, reasons for it, really. Um, I tend to highlight the the era of stagnation as a, a big driver. I, I'm kind of somebody who uh, I, I, I pay a lot of attention to economics when it comes to history. And uh, if you look at the uh, the reforms that were attempted by the Soviet government in the 80s, Gorbachev and all that, um, they, you know, they opened up markets. They, uh, they decentralized, which ultimately led to this I mean, it kind of coincided, maybe even accelerated the decentralization of the entire country politically. And because of that, you had the Kremlin not really as in control as much. And it, it makes sense that you would have this fracture. And uh, Ukraine was just part of many, obviously. So we can maybe show another map here. But so that so um, you basically have an opportunity that and it is like I think we don't really think about that we don't focus enough on this time of history, like the late eighties, early nineties, like how dramatic it was and how devastating it was for so many uh, Russians really to kind of see this fall happen so quickly um, and dramatically. Um, and we, we, uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I think, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm the oldest guy here, but I lived through this as a kid. I remember seeing the Berlin wall fall down and I remember like watching the news and like, oh, there's a new country. Oh, another new country, you know, as a kid seeing this and just being fascinated with it. But Ukraine was one of them. Uh, so if we want to, I guess, uh, so if we're talking specifically about Ukraine um, and their independence movement, I, I, I see written down here the Budapest Memorandum. Does anyone want to speak to that? I'm not sure about If that. I may. Yep. Go ahead. Uh so uh, one of the biggest threats at the moment of USSR's disillusionment was uh, the nuclear weapons, uh, especially for the West. The idea that there will be more uh, nuclear powers uh, was uh, sounding threatening, especially because the 90s were, weren't very stable for the post-Soviet countries, uh, many of them had at least some form of uh, internal strife or civil war or uh, border conflict. Uh, so uh, one of the ideas, I think it was coming mostly from uh, American and uh, British diplomats, was that uh, Ukraine should not have the weapons of uh, mass destruction, nuclear weapons. And as a result, in 1994, uh, something called Budapest Memorandum was signed between, uh, um, in our, for our purpose, for between UK, uh, US, uh, Ukraine, and Russia. Uh, Ukraine was to give its uh, nuclear weapons to Russia, and uh, all countries involved in the signing would accept uh, the current borders of Ukraine as final and not try to change it. So basically, Russia gave Ukraine uh, territorial guarantees in 1994. And as we seen with the uh, uh, Crimean annexation, it was not um, uh, fulfilled. Uh, just an interesting tidbit that uh, Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons because uh, it was promised its territory. Right. And I, I should add, it by Russia. Yeah, and I should add because there are a lot of people go, oh, Ukraine should have kept those weapons. None of this would have happened. But a lot of people don't realize that even if they wanted to, those weapons were ridiculously costly to maintain with the amount that were held there that were previously controlled by Moscow. Yeah, that was the danger. That was danger. Uh, I, I should also add, I probably didn't make it clear. Uh, it's not some kind of defensive pact. So uh, UK and the US do, don't have uh, some kind of obligation to come to Ukraine's uh, help in case of war. It just means, means that uh, US or UK should uh, can't annex uh, part of Ukraine, basically. Uh, and I just realized something that we completely skipped over, and it does have to do with nuclear technology, but not uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Chernobyl. Um, mm. 
because Chernobyl was actually a key part of the breakup of the USSR because um, uh, Gorbachev has already started to implement um, uh, perestroika, which it means like restructuring. Um, yeah. And I'm getting that right, right, Il Ilkin? That's yes, right. hundred percent. Cool. Um, I'm not good with Russian. <laughs> um, it's my bad for jumping in all the time. I'm sorry. Oh no, I, that's, that's <laughs> we need Russian speakers here. Uh, but the the um that and another thing that he was uh was uh it was glasnost as in openness had just been a, a, an official policy, um. As in, like, they were going to publish more information. And then Chernobyl melted down. And uh, a lot of Russians, including Ukrainians themselves, which Chernobyl is in Ukraine. Um, interestingly, there was a battle there um, during this war. Um, but uh, um, the... Uh, the policy of openness was distinctly challenged because it was things like Radio Free Europe, you know, American propaganda that actually informed a lot of Ukrainians of what was happening in their own country. Um, and so, um, and that happened with a lot of stuff throughout uh, the USSR. So uh, that was kind of the impetus to implementing what uh i i'm gonna get this wrong but you can you can correct me uh democratia i think is the term um but basically democracy as in allowing uh, soviet is basically just means like a uh, a workers council or a, a a workers union um you know however you want to say that a labor union um but the uh there were other Soviets within these governments, most uh, profoundly the uh, the um, Solidad movement in Poland, um, and so Demokratia allowed uh, um, these uh, allowed for the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, the breakup of uh, the Eastern Bloc, and everything, and the removal of Soviet power by having other Soviets get elected. That is the essential mechanism by which uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. And it, it was based, uh, and it was partially based on something that happened in Ukraine. Um, so it's important to remember that as well, um, as uh, we're talking about nuclear events, uh, uh, I mean, nuclear powers, and that that uh, that Ukraine has a kind of significant role in that, not just in terms of nuclear weapons, but nuclear power and how that broke apart the uh, the uh, Soviet Union. Right. Uh, so we have, I mean, yeah, a, a lot of people don't, I guess, realize how new Ukraine is as a country, for lack of a better word. Um, it, it was officially December 1st, 1991 was the referendum and its constitution uh, that it, is still in effect in 1996. And we're, we're talking about a country that uh, is developing the whole way and uh, a country that still, uh, sure, lots of resources. We've talked about the agriculture and uh, the legacy of that and the, the, the fertile soil there. But uh, then later on, oil discovered there, but still a developing country that's heavily dependent on its uh, Russian neighbor to the north um, ever since. And uh, I, I did see something. I don't know if we want to talk about this now or because uh, it seems like we're jumping around a little bit here, but uh Somebody put on here the Russian language in the country, the the 2012 language law. Uh, oh, that that's uh, something that we, before we get to that, we should talk about uh, Ukrainian international relations, right? Because um, we were talking okay. about uh, that makes sense. You know, the removal of their uh, nuclear weapons and everything. Um, so. and, and we should talk about like the uh, the Russian NATO Council, the the Civil League or something like that, the um, Ukraine-NATO defensive pact thing, um, and um, how 
uh, Ukraine has been steadily moving. Uh, I guess I should be going this way. Has been steadily moving westward in terms of its uh, particular viewpoint and how that affects Russia. Have we even talked much about NATO? We briefly um, probably should kind of uh, just NATO. What is NATO? <laughs> North Atlantic Organization uh, Treaty. It's a it's a military alliance that was started. Um, by the, uh, the United States and other countries, the late 1940s, um, mostly democratic countries, but not all of them. Um, and it was put into place to um, essentially, uh, it was like part of the, um, the, the fear of the domino theory that the communism with the capital C is gonna spread all around the world. We need to unite to kind of fight this expansion of the Soviet Union. But then in response, the Soviet Union forms the Warsaw Pact and the Eastern Bloc countries as puppet states join them. And this is the kind of the the Cold War. Essentially, this is the these are the two major military alliances throughout the Cold War ends and the Warsaw Pact collapses. But NATO persists, which at first, we, it, you know, uh, with talks between. George H.W. Bush and Boris Yeltsin, it looked like NATO would not be a thing at, at first, but then that quickly, we quickly realized now it's here to stay. Actually, shout out to uh, Cody from oh, Alternate History Hub, just released a video about that. So if you want to catch that. Um, but so yeah, NATO is still around. And not only that, it expands beginning in the late 1990s and over the next 10, 15 years, more and more countries. And so Russia uh, sees this, the, the government of Russia, in particular, Vladimir Putin, um, he sees this as a big threat. And this just feeds into his paranoia that, um, you know, the, the, the West, the West is creeping closer and closer. And now they're trying to get all these former Soviet states to join. And this is just messed up in his mind. So, yeah. And, and I should add, because not a lot of people talk about what, like, uh, Putin, or not not even just Putin, but like what Russia has been doing on their end this entire time. Because like after the Soviet Union collapsed, there was still sort of a level of economic dependency with a lot of the former Soviet states to Russia. Mm -hmm. And so they formed what was called the Commonwealth of Independent States, where they would sort of cooperate with their economies and things like that. And uh, by the early to mid 2000s, like Putin even had ideas for like what is uh, what was going to be called the Eurasian Union and it was going to be like a counter to the European Union. And it hasn't really gotten very far, but basically Ukraine and basically most of the former Soviet countries sort of signed up to start the process for that. And so Russia was actively keeping Ukraine within like economic dependency and proposed political alliances and things of that nature. But then after, uh, after like Crimea, uh, Ukraine left the CIS and plans to join the Eurasian Union. And so I suppose that's kind of the moment when Ukraine is officially leaving like the, the Russian sphere. Yeah. yeah. Although we should point out there's a difference between NATO and the EU, of course. Um, yes. And um, the EU starts off as like an economic union just for trade benefits, uh, basically a free trade union, and uh, and then kind of evolves into a kind of supra state um, that uh, has uh, it has weird abilities. Are not gonna we don't need to get into the mechanics of the EU, but the uh, but has certain abilities to pass uh, legislation that goes for all member states. Um, or that member states have to pass their own versions within a set period of time or something along those lines. There's, there's a lot of uh, funkiness to the way that, that the EU works. But the point being that it it um, is very much about uh, economy, culture, politics, um, rather than the military, which that's NATO. Um, part of the reason why NATO stuck around, uh, uh, a lot of people don't it seem there was of course a lot of people saying that like nato wouldn't would, had no reason to exist after the cold war ended in 1991 because you know the big bad is gone and you know what what enemy is there to fight anymore and it's like well nato was it was 
ultimately meant to fight a you know big bad at some point if uh, if that were to occur but how it functioned was as a military alliance as in uh, standardizing uh, everyone's military around a set of standards so we have like nato nato standard magazines and nato standard uh you know uh, I don't know, just all kinds of different NATO standard stuff. Um, and it was a way of standardizing e uh, each uh, everybody's military. So, of course, it wouldn't go away. Um, it would take a century to, to get rid of NATO altogether. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the whole... Um, so the whole idea of it getting removed was it, it, not exactly wishful thinking, just naive um but at the same time um that's how it functions and that's why it's useful for other groups to come into it but russia still sees nato as this ultimate enemy geared specifically to fight them and as existential threat yes absolutely yeah. even and though it actually functions as just a way of standardizing militaries and uh, having a unified front against a singular enemy. Even, um, and I actually looked it up, it's called the Russian NATO can the uh, Russia NATO council was set up in 2002 um, following uh, 9 11 and the beginning of the war on terror and everything because Russia actually participated in it. Um, they had their own war on terror going kind of already with, uh, with the Chechen wars and all that. Um, and so they saw a distinct advantage in joining in. And so they actually started to work with NATO as of 2002. Um, and uh, while technically that Russian NATO council still exists, it doesn't really do anything after 2014. Um, as uh, NATO kind of uh, after uh, Russia invaded uh, uh, invaded Crimea, NATO kind of went like, nope. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that meant that uh, the U.S. had no impetus to stop the to uh, I mean not the U.S. the NATO had no impetus to stop expanding. Um, now that they weren't working with Russia whatsoever. Um, but even so, the uh, uh, the expansion had taken place because of a series of what were called civic leagues that were also kind of this way of standardizing militaries around certain things. Um, and Ukraine was part of those things. There's a Ukraine. There is a still extant Ukraine NATO civic league, and uh, this was kind of the initial step of joining NATO. Um, it, as uh, but like Russia didn't want it to expand any further, but then it did in 2002, 2003, somewhere on there. So the the whole uh, the Russian NATO Council were kind of doomed to begin with as soon as other countries started joining NATO. Um, but the uh, that expansion was predicated on on this need to uh, standardize militaries, especially as the war on terror started kicking off. Um, so it had very little to do with like, you know, trying to attack R Russia or anything. But Russia sees it as such. And you look um, at the NATO military interventions. I mean, we're Afghanistan, um, Iraq, Libya. I mean, Somalia. This this is not Yugoslavia. Yeah, has has nothing to do with with uh, Russia. Uh, well, Yugoslavia definitely does. <laughs> that was my point, actually. That was the point I was trying to make. Uh, if you look at the uh, Russian uh, propaganda, uh, Yugoslavia and Kosovo are being brought up all the time. Uh, the fact that NATO participated in the Yugoslavian uh -huh. war, etc., etc., etc. But uh, to uh, Cypher's point. Uh, even after Kosovo became uh, independent uh, within, uh, not within, under uh, NATO uh, support, even after that, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, Russia and NATO was not that bad. Uh, some can claim that uh, it became worse after Baltics uh, joined in 2004. Uh, but uh, 
this once again stems from the question if NATO actually promised Russia not to expand uh, to the east, which uh, again, there is no written document, uh, but beyond that, uh, it's not clear even if there was a handshake deal with that. Yeah, we don't know. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's been uh, online a lot, hasn't it? Like, uh, yes, was there uh, everywhere. Was a deal to have <laughs> Russia be part of NATO? And that, I mean, I even like tweeted that, like kind of just like before this whole invasion started. And it's like, you know, what if um, Russia was part of NATO? Where would we be today? You know? That's uh, one of the things that people keep on talking about with Ukraine becoming, uh, you know, uh, so I don't want to skip too much far or forward because this hits on the uh, Budapest conferences of 2008, uh, Bucharest, B- Budapest, I don't know. Uh, but the, uh, but um, part of the reason why Ukraine hasn't had any ability to come into NATO because it requires all uh, member or uh, uh, states to actually uh, uh, all agree to um, somebody coming into the organization. Um, and part of the reason why nobody would agree to uh, Ukraine coming into the organization is because Russia has, uh, it, they have this disputed territory with uh, Crimea. And of course, the Donbass uh, conflict was ongoing. So the, uh, um, <clears throat> The those two things basically guarantee that they w- uh, would not become uh, NATO members, even though. Uh, I, I should I go ahead and move forward to the two thousand eight thing. Yeah, sure. I, I think that's fine. Just one note that I forgot to mention when we were talking about the partition of the USSR. Uh, the moment USSR actually uh, stopped being USSR uh, was when uh, the leaders of uh, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and Russia decided it. So uh, it's uh, an interesting thing that uh, no other Soviet state was even asked about it. Just Ukraine, Belarus, and uh, Russia decided it. So in a way, uh, that kind of gives uh, uh, sovereignty of Ukraine a different weight in, in the eyes of Russia, I guess. Uh, it was uh, it it was considered the state that created uh, the Soviet Union, and then it was considered the state that uh, was uh, the one that uh, decided on its partition. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and um, so uh, because there is that kind of special relationship with uh, Ukraine and Russia, and we'll I'm sure we'll get to the whole thing with. Uh, Ukrainian internal politics and how that affects Putin, but uh, the the whole thing with um, the 2008 Bucharest summit, I, I looked it up, it's Bucharest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the Bucharest summit uh, was a real turning point in NATO-Russian relations, specifically regarding uh, Ukraine, because um, basically they declared that like NATO isn't going to be bringing in Ukraine right now but they reserve the right to mm. and so it was basically this open declaration of NATO will uh, will eventually bring them in um, you know once these current conflicts are resolved um, the the uh, interesting thing with the, uh, with uh, NATO, if NATO were to bring in um, Ukraine, is uh, uh, from the Russian point of view, I should say, is that it would be a massive strategic victory in ter- if you view NATO as like this uh, ultimate force trying to fight Russia. Um, it's not that. It hasn't been that since 1991. But um, that's still how Russians see it, especially Putin. Um, and the uh, and um, Ukraine obviously shares a border and everything, but it's also a strategic victory because there is this large plains region that um, that spreads from Germany eastward. And um, basically, if you wanted to move uh, move a bunch of tanks and and heavy um, vehicles and everything. It becomes a lot easier if you can get it through uh, Ukraine if you're trying to attack Russia. 
One might say it's an important step. Uh, <laughs> no, because it's pronounced stepper. <laughs> oh, you gotta be that Steppy. Uh, steppy. It's steppy. a steppy. Yeah. <laughs> I like step better. Okay, now uh, we're gonna do some Englishification and just say it's step. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would also like to add one thing, which a lot of like maybe even misinformation, but definitely Russian propaganda is saying, and they're like treating NATO as in a way being expansionist, but like it's the NATO that's doing the expansion, not the countries w like choosing to join NATO. Right. Uh, so yeah. that's, the, uh, I think that we should actually talk about that. that like these are countries, often the, the former part of the Warsaw Pact countries that uh, because they have negative views of Russia and when they became independent, wanted to like, be more Western because of fears of Russia oftentimes. And it wasn't like, you know, NATO coming in and being like, okay, you're part of us now. Like th th these countries actually had to willingly go into this and like do stuff to be part of NATO. So it wasn't like NATO being expansionist as it is often portrayed by Russian propaganda. Yeah. Very good point. And it's another just like thing in terms of the strategy point, um, in terms of like being able to move um, troops through uh, from Germany over to uh, to Ukraine, which has a massive border with that. NATO already shares a border with Russia in uh, Estonia and Latvia. Yeah. Um, and, you know, NATO also definitely uh, has the naval assets to be able to, because uh, there's there's this oh, little did. chunk of uh, what used to be Germany, uh, what used to be Prussia, and now is Russia. That little chunk, I'm forgetting what Kaliningrad. it's called. Kaliningrad. Yeah. Kaliningrad, yeah. Um, that could theoretically cut off, uh, cut off uh, transport by land, um, if they were to, you know, invade. Uh, invade uh, i've got to pull up the map uh invade lithuania and you know take over from belarus to to um to kaliningrad yep but there's that there's riga which is a, a great port to land all this stuff on has all the rail assets you possibly need so um you can see riga right there at the north yeah so, capital city of latvia so the there's uh there's really no reason to to act like the uh, like Ukraine coming into uh, NATO would somehow be this massive strategic win. Like NATO already has a, ma a massive strategic win with Latvia and Estonia. Um, like it's already there. Yeah. Um, so this this is very much a delusion um, by uh, trumped up by Russian nationalism. And for Tiger Star, did you get something? Yeah, it's like it's kind of been this weird, like geopolitical thing that's going all the way back to like Napoleon, like the end of Napoleon, where a lot of people have this idea of like, okay, so the big countries, the big boys, are the ones who are like making all the decisions for everything. <laughs> um, at the end of Napoleon, you had like the Congress of Europe, but it's just France, Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia. That are kind of deciding the fate of the whole continent you had a similar thing for both the world wars and it's almost this weird thing where a lot of people who are in geopolitics can't comprehend the idea of a smaller country like having their own things that they want and that they're not always like oh yes sir russia and or america we will do exactly what you want we are just pawns in your game it's and and it's really weird. Like these countries are choosing to join NATO because they want to. It's not always, be even if it happens to align with the interests of another country, it's not like that, like Russia and America are secretly like forcing them to do all these things behind closed doors or something. And it's also important to note that um, th uh, this very much parallels the entire beginning of the Cold War where um, the, the intent of each side is just completely being ignored um you know th that russians are portraying nato as this like entity that's trying to uh invade and expand and it's ultimately controlled by the americans <laughs> but like that's obviously not what it is it's it's very clear and you know we have the internet now come on um but like 
um, the same thing happened at the beginning of the Cold War, where, uh, where, you know, there were attempts, for instance, to bring uh, Russia into the Marshall Plan, um, and Russia saw this as like a secret conspiracy to Americanize uh, Russian industry and all that kind of stuff. It's like you guys can been getting lend lease for five years, you're fine. Um, but like the uh, and. It, it, it and it the other it goes the other way too. Don't don't get me wrong, yeah. but we're not talking about the other way. <laughs> we're not talking about an actual American um, attempt to to stop Russia and all that kind of stuff. It's... We're not talking about an actual containment policy, <clears throat> containment policy or anything. None of that exists here it, at this point. It's unilateral aggression from Russia. Pretend, trying to pretend that sovereign states joining a treaty organization is invasion. Yeah. Um, and Maybe before if, we get to that, though, uh, I, I, think... I also wanted to say, sorry, uh, I also wanted but... to say it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy on the side of Russia because Russia is saying, like, oh, look, NATO's expanding. We got to do something. Then they do something countries like Slovakia or the ba uh, Baltics get scared, join NATO. Russia is like, look, they're expanding, even though it was because Russia did something that made countries scared. And then they do something again. And then like suddenly Finland and Sweden's thinking about joining NATO. And then you have, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy where Russia can always be like, look, it's happening. We were saying it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially when you portray it as a, as like a malevolent force and, the malevolent force doing anything. I mean, think about how if you ever use the CIA fact book for anything, <laughs> suddenly you're going to get a bunch of comments going like, you're working for the CIA. It's like, no, it's just the CIA. Like, that's literally their job is to like find what the population of a country is. Of course, I'm going to go to the CIA <laughs> fact data. Book. Yeah. Um, I, I do uh, think a big part of what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine today goes back to um, these. Uh, well, the revolution of dignity is something that I think we we need to talk about. Um, the uh, so there's another name for it. Oh, maiden revolution is that how you pronounce maidan revolution? I don't know. Maidan. Um, maidan. Oh, thanks. Okay. Maidan. Maidan revolution. Okay. I've been uh, saying it wrong. No, I'm not on. an expert on this, but I do know that um, the president that uh, at the time was more Russian friendly and against uh, joining up with the rest of Europe, European Union, all that. I can't even pronounce his name for crying out loud. So somebody who knows more about the revolution of dignity want to speak on the. Uh, Let me in. Let me in. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so. Uh... Uh, when Ukraine became independent, the president became the dude called Kuchma. Uh, I wouldn't call him pro-Russian or anti-Russian, but he was a former Soviet uh, party member. And as such, uh, he had, uh, I would say, uh, propensity for corruption is a good word. Uh, and uh, relationship with Russia was okay at that time. Uh, but uh, at some point in uh, 2004, uh, he tried to pass power to his prime minister, Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, it's not 100% clear if Yanukovych was already a person approved by Putin or not at this point. Uh, we know that uh, his party uh, was... Uh, had the support of uh, Russian-speaking population, mostly, mostly from the eastern and southern part of Ukraine, from Crimea and from Donbas. Uh, but regardless, he was appointed prime minister and uh, he was a candidate of the ruling party in the elections. Opposing him uh, was a person uh, called uh, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, and uh, at, we didn't, when uh, these events were just happening, we didn't think that uh, Yushchenko had any chance to come to power, to be honest, because uh, it seemed like uh, the elections will be uh, falsified to a degree. Uh, and 
when they happened, uh, they indeed were falsified. But uh, before elections even happened, uh, the event happened uh, with Yushchenko. He was poisoned. Uh, I don't know if you have the photos, but if you can Google Yushchenko before and after poison and can show it on screen because it's uh, really uh, horrifying. I don't know how to spell his name. Okay, so yeah, it's Yushchenko. I just typed it in chat. So uh, basically, Yushchenko was poisoned uh, by what some claim is through the Russian uh, Secret Service agents. And on this um, wave, on this, uh, like after this poisoning, he gained mass support uh, uh, from all parts of Ukrainian society. And uh, when the elections happened, uh, the ruling party had no other choice but to uh, falsify them. As a result, uh, there was a uh, big protests against uh, Yanukovych, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. European Union and Russia both uh, tried to mediate the situation because it was really getting out of hand. And uh, uh, it was agreed that there will be a third uh, elections to decide who is the winner and uh, Yushchenko won yet again. Uh, unfortunately, Despite the fact that Yushchenko came on the wave of uh, promises to democratize and uh, liberalize the country, uh, he wasn't able to deal with the uh, corruption within Ukraine. Uh, so uh, just four years later, in the next elections, uh, Yanukovych was uh, elected as president. Uh, I would like to add a small detail, uh, which is connected to the uh, American po uh, politics. Uh, the people who were advising uh, Yanukovych's campaign in 2008 uh, were led by certain Paul Manafort, who you guys might remember from uh, Trump presidency, mm -hmm. because he was Trump's uh, campaign manager too. Uh, so when uh, Yanukovych came to power in 2008, uh, there was this um, a PR campaign going for him in the Western media claiming that, you see, he's working with the American campaign manager, he will be West facing, he will, be, uh, he will try to liberalize the uh, uh, Ukrainian economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but obviously uh, he didn't. And um, the corruption within Ukraine continued being a very big problem. Uh, we often talk about oligarchs uh, within the uh, Russian economy, but Ukrainian oligarchs, uh, despite being not as rich, were as prominent, and they uh, indeed had a vast influence on the political situation. Uh, I think Cypher mentioned uh, the uh, Russian attempts to create what they called uh, the Customs Union. Uh, the Customs Union uh, was and still is an idea really similar to the EU in its, uh, in its structure. Uh, it's idea to have, not have any uh, visa requirements, to not have any uh, custom duties, etc., 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 within uh, countries that are part of it and uh i if i'm not mistaken in 2012 russia started pushing ukraine into joining uh customs union and this is when uh uh opposition within ukraine started really ramping up to this idea uh, because uh the customs union uh, seems like an economic union, and it is, but it also has a, a military arm. I can't remember its name off the top of my head, but basically it's called uh, in Russian ODKB, which is uh, something like Corporation of uh, Defense something, something, something. And uh, 
being in customs union implies that you also have to be part of ODKB, which would put Ukrainian army under the uh, Russian uh, leadership, let's say. So it's kind of a form of NATO. So uh, in 2012, uh, this tension started to flare up. Eventually, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, EU uh, and Ukraine ne were negotiating regarding uh, how Ukraine can enter the European market. And uh, to be honest, at that point in time, again, we didn't expect that Ukraine will be accepted because uh, as uh, you guys mentioned, NATO has a whole bunch of rules to be part of it. And uh, this is the same for EU. Uh, there, there should be certain democratization of the economy. There should be certain uh, liberal laws adopted, etc., etc., etc. And Ukraine was nowhere close in 2013. But despite that, uh, EU kind of gave them uh, what they call a roadmap. So uh, this is ten things that you have to do to be able to be considered for our membership. And uh, Yanukovych. Kind of, I, I, I'm trying not to editorialize this, but Yanukovych kind of showed that he is interested in implementing the roadmap. Uh, but almost immediately afterwards, uh, in 2014, he um, he announced that Ukraine will be joining the uh, customs union, and that's when what we now call Yevo Maidan uh, began. So. The word Maidan uh, means square, as in the place that you hold a rally. And uh, there's a big one in the center of uh, Kiev uh, that's called Square of Independence. Yeah, uh, that's that's a picture from it. Uh, so there are too many details to go in, but basically the idea of this movement called Yevo Maidan uh, was to uh, enter EU to have uh, Ukraine to be on the path to enter EU. Uh, I remember uh, in 2014, the uh, polls conducted within Ukraine, uh, there was a like something like 55 to 60 percent uh, desire to enter EU, and uh, only something like 25 percent of people wanted uh, NATO membership. So the NATO membership wasn't discussed, it wasn't uh, talked about, it wasn't even popular within the opposition movement itself. The main goal was to uh, be part of the European Union. Uh, we don't know who was behind this, but at some point during the protests, a uh, hundred or so protesters were killed by the uh, snipers. And uh, that led to the escalation of the situation. Uh, obviously, uh, fights with the police, fights with the army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At some point in 2014, I think it was something like early March or early April, uh, Yanukovych announced that um, he was under threat. Uh, he, was get, he was going to get killed. So he left Kiev for Kharkiv first and then for Russia. And this is basically the history of uh, the Yevo Maidan movement. Okay. And, and that was a distinct, uh, a distinct and abrupt change in terms of Ukrainian politics, right? Yes. The, the, like that was um, because suddenly you started having more presidents who were... Uh, were fairly pro um e not just um not just kind of like ambivalent about uh joining the eu but just like straight up wants to um implement all the tests of of joining the eu um <clears throat> something to also point out was the uh i'm forgetting the the color of the revolution but orange, it was orange like, revolution orange. Thank you. That was but nice. there was there was one back in two thousand four. I think I'm getting that. Wait, I have a, I have, hold on. Yeah, the Poland one. Two thousand four. No, it's a uh, it's that Ukraine. Was the contested election that um, talking about. But it was also oh. because the uh, like the president had like ha had been recorded straight up planning to assassinate his opposition or something like that. 
Um, just uh, uh, it, it's called like the cassette controversy or something like that. But it was also the person who was particularly targeted, uh, who, not targeted, but who was the subject of that scandal uh, was fairly pro-Russian. Um, so there, so even before the um, my, I'm going to say it wrong, Maidan. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. We right. struggle with the... cool. <laughs> so even before the Maidan movement, there had been a study kind of moved towards the West. That's why they had started bargaining with the EU and everything. Um, and uh, this was kind of the breaking point, and it was such a breaking point that it's later on that year from Maidan um, was when Russia invaded Crimea. Um, so you could see a direct response to the loss of, uh, of not exactly a puppet regime or anything, but like a vaguely pro-Russian regime. I mean, after all, the president literally fled to Russia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and their response is to to conquer territory within uh, Crimea, uh, I mean, to conquer Crimea. So, um, lo and behold, as they're starting to move towards EU membership again, what happened? <laughs> they start building up troops on the border, recognize uh, the breakaway states in the Donbass, and then initiate an entire um, an entire invasion. So you could kind of see 2014 as a uh, as kind of a uh, uh, first run of all of this, yeah. and Maidan is very much part of that. The, and it's because it directly threatens Putin, right? Um, the uh, it the whole movement of of uh, Ukraine towards the east i mean to the west um coincides with uh putin losing oligarchical power as they start to look to uh somebody else to replace him who might uh be better on these matters um in a way he's got internal pressure it's just not the russian people it's the oligarchs um and his whole being a strong man thing um absolutely coincides with having to be uh you know the person who is in charge of a uh, whole bunch of not puppet regimes but you know friendly regimes and then we we could also mention uh, georgia Chech chechnya chechnya che 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 <laughs> thank you <laughs> now i'm struggling um <clears throat> so this is um you have multiple i guess uh attempts to expand literal territory also spheres of influence um that are happening like georgia was 2008 i believe the invasion of georgia and that was also when they were considering about adding georgia to nato at that point too that's right yep so they and then, have it, but you know it, the talks started Again, to, just to, the previous point, to the previous point, uh, Georgia had at least two uh, territorial conflicts uh, with Ossetia and Abkhazia, so there was no way they would be accepted to NATO. Uh, that was just not something NATO would consider. They were given a roadmap uh, to modernize their army uh, to be able to be considered down the line. So uh, this is a very uh, shallow premise for the Russian invasion, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. and something to point out is that the, that Bucharest conference that we were talking, the Bucharest summit in 2008 happened um, and uh, came out on the 4th of April 2008, and um, the South Ossetia War um was in August of 2008. So we see a pattern. Yeah. Um, now, do we want to talk about Donbass now? Um, 
the Donbass complex conflict? Um, uh, I think we missed a few points with Crimea. Uh, so the main Russian interest in Crimea for, uh, I guess, centuries was uh, Sevastopol. This is a, a port city to the southwest. Uh, Russia had um, a naval base there, uh, which was central to their Black Sea fleet. What was the? I'm sorry. What, where was the naval base? Sevastopol. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it says uh, it's a southwest of the peninsula. Yeah, it's up here. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, there was this uh, Russian propaganda was claiming that uh, Ukraine will jo join NATO and Sevastopol will be lost uh, to the Russian Navy forever. In reality, uh, Crimea was annexed in 2014 and the uh, Russian Navy had, a, uh, had the rights to Sevastopol for another five years or four years, if I'm not mistaken. So. Uh, this wasn't this wasn't something that was happening immediately or needed immediate response. Uh, I guess I would agree with Cyber here that it was more of a power play to show uh, who is in control, who is in charge of the situation. Yeah. Well, this yeah. is also like a. I mean, in, in so many ways, this is a prelude to what happened. Or what's happening right now because they're you know putin was wanting to see if he could get away with it and, and he did mm -hmm. and also uh um you know the uh something to keep in mind with all that is that it the an annexation of crimea was also predicated on a bunch of propaganda of like oh no they actually want to be part of uh <laughs> russia and all that kind of stuff remember the whole uh green men and um Welcome, and welcoming them yeah and um, like green men at the polls um that they supposedly held a poll and it came out to be like 99 percent want to be part of russia or something like that well, there's also footage they released as they see they're like they're they're cheering the russians as they as they the tanks roll in <laughs> as they they're all caught up in unison yeah. <laughs> minorities to not participate in that election <laughs> so. um and something to keep uh, something to also remember about crimea is that um a good chunk of it is basically desert um you know it's not there it, yeah, it's okay. fairly uninhabitable um in fact it relies heavily on ukraine for water well up until 2014 at least uh and uh you know the uh, russians had to build underneath that little gap next to uh, i'm not going to try to say it kretch or something Kerch. i'm not Kerch. Cool, <laughs> that <laughs> and like they had to build waterways under there to be able to water the peninsula and that because the uh, the canal um, to Crimea has been cut off. In fact, that's one of the main uh, military goals that they started with in uh, this invasion from Crimea up north was to get uh, control of that canal that they lost access to in 2014, so that now they can start to water. The peninsula that's been having just a terrible drought for the last couple of years um so um you know there's there are definitely uh strategic things to this for instance uh russia's like a big exporter of um of uh natural gas and there's a bunch of natural gas reserves that are near that that were discovered in 2014 yeah wonder why that happened there's but also like, been discussion about like europe trying to get off the dependency of russian natural gas but ukraine has some too so maybe if ukraine joins the eu there's the worry that russia would be even more economically isolated which would right. yeah. they shot themselves Although, in both feet doing that so i always take great issue if you're pure, purely purely analyzing um wars as wars over resources and that the very few wars are actually just wars over resources there's always a lot more complication to it sure. but is the imp but fact. the impetus to it is absolutely from uh you know the fact that the, you know there's that uh, there's natural gas all over the uh crimea and so like then they discovered in 2014 
perfect excuse to to uh you know with the whole maidan stuff going on it's oh no no crimea wants to be part of russia again well there's that real life lore video that i sent you uh cypher that uh kind of oversimplify i mean it's you know he it, a lot of people watched that video, uh, more than 10 million last I checked, and it kind of oversimplified saying it was just about the oil and the resources. Um, yeah, that's a that's a huge problem because that's not really what this war is about. We've been t- we've barely hit on resources after what nearly three hours. I mean, um, it underlies everything, like you said, but yeah, there's just so much more to the story that it would such it's such a it's a it's a it's almost a dangerous oversimplification. Yeah. Cause like, if you really, <clears throat> I think um, <laughs> it's never that simple. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, that's why Putin did the whole like, Oh no, we, they want to be part of Russia. It's not purely because of resources or anything. It's because they have this like historical claim to Crimea that uh, Ru- like Crimea was part of Russia all the way until uh, I think it was 1961 um 54 54 really khrushchev was the one who passed yeah. it over to ukraine yeah but khrushchev didn't really solidify his power for a while um, okay um anyways the uh uh the fact is it's not until the mid 20th century that the uh that crimea becomes part of ukraine so they were very much playing well, this this political game of well, and it was, we do have to be fair, like, um, the, you know, when Ukraine first became a country, overwhelmingly, most of the country was all for independence, but um, Crimea was, it barely half of, of Crimea, I think I looked it up. 55%. Before. Yeah, 55%, only 55% with a 60% turnout. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's, well, okay. <laughs> but that's still a majority. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to to gauge what they actually want when you have what were uh, up until the actual like official annexation were called the green men because they weren't wearing their uh, their uh, flag on their right arm, um, but they uh, they were very obviously Russian troops, and you know Russia kind of started to do the same thing with Donbass. Um, playing the game of like oh no we're now recognizing these republics and then putin just went nah screw it all in um that that was what surprised me with all the stuff that happened a few weeks ago that started all this a couple weeks ago was the fact that he seemed to be playing the same book with the donbass but this time no one's falling for it at all well, yeah, I mean, nobody well, was really falling for it in the first lost. place. Yeah. <laughs> nobody was falling for it in Crimea. Uh, but, like, he seemed to be playing that game. And then just one night, he just completely turned it around and said, no, nah, all of Ukraine. And that was what was surprising to so many people, was not that he would recognize the Donbass. I mean, like, we had sanctions lined up to go. It was like a matter of hours once he recognized the Dom- the uh, two breakaway things we had uh we had uh sanctions specifically set up for that but then once the war got started suddenly everybody's just like okay what do we do <laughs> so um, the war on Donbass, yeah funny. started 2014 right this is the same yeah it was th- around the same time as crimea is just it wasn't annexed it was they were just supported unofficially by russia uh, mm-hmm. these like breakaway states and around it's been a, around Donetsk and Luhansk, the main two cities. And it's been a like while there's been numerous ceasefires and uh, and you know pieces and the UN periodically has come in to have UN peacekeepers throughout the area. That fighting has basically been uh, this has been a low level f- conflict since then. In fact, Zelensky when he came to power um because the weird way that he got elected was that he uh he like crowdsourced his uh his platform <laughs> like he literally just like had like uh instagram posts going like hey what should i talk about and like you know got that his stuff from that and one of the things was of course peace in Nombass. um and he proclaimed that it was and you can actually see his approval rating up until a few weeks ago just plummeting because um like it wasn't getting solved. Um, 
even though that was one of the things he campaigned on. And uh, his his uh, his approval rating was just plummeting. At the, I think it was at like twenty nine percent when um, when this war began. But holy crap, has he turned that around? Right, he's become a heck of a leader yeah. in the middle of all this. But at, in the uh, beginning of this year, he was seen as a failure already. Well, so, he was seen. He 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 was elected as a populist in many ways. Like, uh, um, and he seemed to be just another oligarch at the, in January. But then once he, I think once he made that decision to uh, stay and fight, that was a, whether it be a PR move or like, I, I think it's genuine. I think this guy believes in um, Ukraine and every meaning of, the, of what Ukraine is. Um, yeah. He's a hero now. He's, it's hard to like, and it's funny how we just are now bringing up uh, Zelensky. We're almost three hours into this stream. He's only been in office for how long? Since 2019. Yeah. Uh, and he's someone who I would not say was like, I mean, an anti-Russian dude. He was just like not like a puppet to them. Yes, this like, is an important point, actually. Uh, there's propaganda going on that uh, Zelensky is my dumb president, but... Mm -hmm. uh, the person who was elected after Maidan is a dude called Palashenko, and Zelensky defeated him uh, in 2019. So uh, this is uh, all, already the power in Ukraine changed after the Maidan. So uh, again, that propaganda piece makes no sense too. Uh, well, I've also heard, uh, I've seen a bunch of tanky comments talking about color revolutionaries doing everything in Ukraine. It's like, are you talking about 2004? <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> but uh, but what's interesting with uh, Zelensky is that he was elected as like a populist, right? He, I mean, he, very much like Trump. He was, uh, he's a freaking um, TV star and... Uh, he even starred in a uh, in a movie where, like, a, as an accidental president. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And then he becomes president. Um, but like, um, mostly he was railing against an establishment, which is base, which is the basic rule book of being a populist. You have something that you're is some sort of establishment that you're fighting. Mm -hmm. Um, and the uh, um but his his platform was never very clear to begin with it was mostly a referendum on the previous president um yeah very demagoguery yeah <laughs> and um and so like it was very much about like uh the the one clear thing that he campaigned for was that he wanted to end the conflict in donbass um and uh he also had, had been making serious moves towards the EU, which started up the military buildup of in the, uh, I mean, the whole thing that started this, um, it was his move towards the EU. Um, and funny thing is, I think that's kind of backfired in Putin's face, especially when Zelensky did that fairly emotional, um, you know, speech in front of the EU and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, now the EU is very much like, let's bring him in. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I feel like, um, I mean, I, I, I maybe, is there anything else before talking about the current state of things? Um, and is there anything else we want to bring up in terms of between the years 2014 and 2022 in Ukraine, any other things we should bring up to add better context to what's going on right now? Are we missing something? It's important to understand what's going on in Donbass. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about that much. Most most people in the leadership of Donbass are not locals. Like uh, we can, we, uh, it's it's easy to understand that Donbass is predominantly Russian speaking region, etc., etc., etc. But uh, the people who were at the start of the movement. Uh, to create this called republics in Donbas, they weren't from Ukraine. They were from Russia. Uh, most of them were uh, veterans of Russian army to some extent, or of Russian secret services. 
and uh, it was openly known uh, that their leader at the time, the dude called Kirkin, uh, he was previously active during the uh, Russian support of the war in Abkhazia and Ossetia. So uh, this is uh, this was just a continuation of the uh, Green Man tactic to some extent. Obviously, there were people in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, who were uh, on the side of Russia, but uh, the leadership was and still is uh, from Russia itself. So this is, uh, I guess, the term that we would use is astroturfing to some extent. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, uh, of you know, the, that it's a mainly Russian-speaking region and that something we should talk about, and I know um, uh, <laughs> Matus, Matus, is, uh, Matus yeah. sorry, <laughs> no worries. Um, is especially good on this, um, language laws. Oh, yeah, I'm on, like, anything, I have been quite quiet for the past hour probably because anything modern, I'm a medievalist, so I'm a bit out of my... Uh, comfort zone here but i did research the language laws for my video specifically because there was a clear shift obviously after 2014 um, towards ukrainian nationalism a bit because of all the things that happened in 2014 uh and and i feel like the clearest you can see that is in the language laws that were passed since 2014 to 2019 uh, even though you can probably see that shift towards nationalism uh, in, in other areas. Uh, but it's not like, because nationalism has many uh, ways of uh, expressing itself and it, the sound can be very negative, others don't have to be. So uh, that's another thing uh, that needs to be, that like you should take into account that like a lot of people might think like, oh, nationalism. That's bad, or some depending on what political spectrum you're on. And but it wasn't. It isn't full nationalism. It just means that more more nationalistic ideas started to be implemented when it came to the Ukrainian language. Because before before then, there was a very bilingual kind of stance on language in Ukraine. A lot of people used Russian, uh, who would see themselves as ethnic Ukrainians. Um, a lot of r native Russian speakers would see themselves as ethnic Ukrainians. Uh, so mm -hmm. la language wasn't everything, but uh, uh, to standardize this more, standardize this more, and to build more of a national narrative and culture, it, it's kind of going back all the way to Herder, honestly, uh, a historian who who was very into linguistics, who was very big proponent of nation states having one one language, and this was Ukraine since the 2014 started implementing laws to try to have one national language and that'd be ukrainian and not russian um but at the same time uh, all the russian propaganda that's talking about how russians are being suppressed and they can no longer use their language and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. during my research i found that's not necessarily the case like russian still counted as a minority language in ukraine that means it's given certain rights of protection uh it just what the laws did uh, the conservative one, uh, ones in 2014, 2017, and 2019 was that you cr that Russians could no longer replace Ukrainian in in areas of uh, like schooling or newspapers and stuff like that. You could still publish newspapers in Russian, but you also had to do it in Ukrainian. You could s still mm -hmm. teach Russian, but uh, you couldn't teach everything in Russian and only Russian. You also had to teach Ukrainian to kids. Uh, so it was it was these laws and these laws were actually controversial not just in ukraine but also outside of ukraine because ukraine had a sizable uh, mainly uh, hungarian and romanian minorities or, or romanian speaking minorities valachs and and they weren't happy about that especially hungarians because there were people uh, Hungarian speaking people in in Ukraine that suddenly were used to being taught in Hungarian everything and suddenly they're like no you have to teach this in Ukrainian you can still teach Hungarian but like math or whatever and it has to be t taught in Ukrainian uh, so it were uh, there were these kinds of laws uh, that depending on where you stand you might seem like okay that's normal that's just a country trying to you know enforce its own language uh, uh, and and some others may seem like suppression. Like, uh, yes, they can they can teach their own language, but at the same time, they have to learn 
the country's language that does not write. So it just depends on how you look at uh, what, where you stand on that. Yeah, I think it's also important to with perspective on, um, you know, you, Ukraine, Ukrainians are younger on average than, say, Americans or British or most Western European countries. And you got to remember, like, if you're 20 years old right now in Ukraine, you were born in 2002. This is like you have a strong uh, connection with with your country. And even Zelensky, it, who is, I believe, three or four years older than me. I mean, he doesn't even remember much of the old Soviet days. You know, like it's um, we're talking about, uh, you know, a country of 40 some million people. But of that, a pretty big chunk of the people, they, did, they don't even know anything else other than uh, Ukraine. And uh, so I, I, I do think that Putin maybe was a little late uh, in his invasion. If he would have done it 20 years ago, say, he might have been more successful. I just checked. Zelensky would have been 13 when the Soviet Union fell apart. Mm, see, yeah, that's probably wasn't even paying uh, attention. Yeah, so so that's what I'll say with the language loss. Uh, but I guess to, to, to end with, I would also like to talk about a bit um, about my experiences uh, because sure. I am... Uh, oh, well, a bit. I'll, I'll just close off with that. Uh, and then yeah, you guys we, we'll wrap this up here. Um, actually, before you, you say that, Matus, yeah. um, we've gone about three hours. If you are just now joining us, we've been attempting to contextualize the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, this is a, uh, a charity stream. I, would I highly encourage you all to, um, to donate either to the Ukrainian Red Cross or you can more easily do it um, if you look up on the, in the chat. There's a tab you can click on to directly donate to the Ukraine Save the Children Fund. Again, there are at least a million Ukrainian children who are displaced because of this conflict, and this is just one easy way that you can help. Um, it so says I says that we raised thirteen thousand dollars already. That's no. a bunch of YouTubers collectively. Actually, this is. Oh, okay. I was like, whoa. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I snatched this from. Uh, alternate history hubs. Uh, he, he was doing the same campaign. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're going to wrap this up by kind of uh, looking at today and yeah, Matus, you want to kind of, cause uh, may maybe tell the audience where you're from too. That would help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would, that would help maybe. Yeah. So I'm from Slovakia. Uh, I have, uh, I was born there. I grew up there. I speak Slovak. Uh, and uh, so Slovakia borders Ukraine. If you don't know, not a big border, Poland has a much bigger border, but we do border Ukraine. And when this whole thing started, I was in Slovakia, actually, at the time. I'm not there anymore. Um, and it was it was a big shock to everyone in Slovakia. And it still is. And I'm sure it's a big shock to all the bordering countries that, that are... <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, it's just... Uh, Ilkin is BMing me in the chat a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I feel like <clears throat> uh, to, to, to this day, basically, when I talk to family, when I talk to friends and when I was still in Slovakia, when you went to the pub, to the store, everyone would just talk about uh, the war and everyone still does. And everyone, a lot of people still have memories of the old communist regimes, which were propped up by the uh, USSR. And for example, my grandfather uh, was married August 20th, 1968, which is when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia because it was leaning too far away from their sphere of influence. Uh, he likes to joke that the Russian tanks came to his wedding because they just couldn't miss it. Uh, but uh, uh, there is definitely a memory, like these people that have a memory of Russian invasion in, in Slovakia and uh, in Hungary with the Hungarian invasion. And um, I think that's why a lot of people are trying to help the Ukrainian refugees uh, right now. Uh, and I'm sure they're they're having far more, far bigger troubles in Ukraine than the bordering countries. But at the time, the, the refugee crisis is bad and it's going to get worse. And 
I would like to just emphasize that, like it's the biggest refugee crisis since World War II in Europe, and it's it's gonna be a big problem. And countries in Eastern Europe aren't the biggest economies. Uh, like they are part of EU, but like Slovakia, uh, like we're not, we don't have necessarily the money to like take care of all these people, especially if they come. Especially same with Poland, same with Romania. Uh, so maybe maybe looking to future, try to try to deal with that. That would be like a thing. I have friends from high school that went to the border to help. I have Ukrainian friends that were drafted that are somewhere in Kiev right now. Uh, hey, Dimitri. Uh, and uh, it, it, I, there's a lot of people that have been affected by this. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, there's also a lot of things that are coming out with human trafficking, sadly. A lot of people are taking advantage of refugees going across the border. Uh, and then especially young girls being taken to like Western countries for uh, sex sexual uh, stuff and, and even uh, forced labor and stuff. So th there's there's people taking advantage of the situation. There's not necessarily a lot of money in these countries to deal with the refugee situation and and how that will develop. It's we'll, we'll see. But that's kind of uh, how me and my country have been affected. And that's kind of what we have to deal with currently. Um, uh, and yeah, that's that's all I wanted to say. Well, it feels like yeah, it's important to mention that this conflict we are trying to talk it in historical terms, but real people are suffering there right now. Uh, two of uh, our freelancers are currently in Kiev, and unfortunately, I lost uh, contact with them a few days ago, and. Uh, there is nothing I can do to help. Uh, so I hope that the pressure of the international community will continue in the coming days. I guess uh, we can talk about this once again uh, when the conflict uh, boils over a bit. But for now, uh, let's just hope that uh, people will stop suffering in Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, this is something I didn't want to talk about. Frankly, I didn't want to do this. I was actually, Mrs. Beat told me not to do this stream. She's like, why are you even, the Russian bots are going to be after you all this stuff. And I'm like, well, but there's so much misinformation. And it feels like, and it's mostly younger folks that I guess just haven't learned the full history. But I, I almost feel like we're obligated to do stuff like this. Um, we probably should have done it three weeks ago before this all began. Well, we didn't know it. Th it's been going on for about three weeks. Can you believe it? Um, because there's just so much people fall for. I'm amazed by how many, and I, I you know, this is nothing against anyone who's Russian. Of course, um, we, we, uh, we realize this is a very small group of people in the Russian government that are orchestrating everything. And, um, so we are we are especially uh, empathetic to the Russian protesters who are beyond courageous what, what they've been doing. But I, I in, here in the United States, I've noticed just uh, too many people are falling for for uh, Russian propaganda. And this is propaganda that's literally just bad history, just rewriting history. And as historians, we hate to see that used to justify um war crimes, uh, civilians being slaughtered. And uh, yeah, these are real people. This is a uh, something that I think is just we it, it needs to end. I don't even care. We I, I'm tired of these. <laughs> a lot of them are my subscribers. They're just like watching this as if it's a freaking video game. It's not a video game. These are real, real people that are dying. And I have a friend from Ukraine who had family that luckily got out but like you said ilkin you have people that you work with that are dealing with like we we're freaking youtubers how privileged are we that we you know and i'm watching ukrainian um vloggers who they've turned into uh real journalists because they are just like this is what's happening as i'm trying to escape my country and we must never forget that. Sorry to rant a little bit there. Anyone else want to have uh, final thoughts about where we are today? I mean, that that's perfectly summed because like there there's one channel in particular and I, I forget the full name because it's just his name. It's like Andre starts with a V, 
but like before I, I was like sub to him just because like he was a Metallica fan and he played guitar and he just did a lot of like, oh, look at me, I'm playing Metallica on the guitar. And that's like all he did. But as soon as like the war began, it instantly turned into like first person vlog about, hey, so me and my family just got on the last available train out of Kiev and we fled to Lviv and oh, hey, so there was a bombing raid the, the other day and just like instantly overnight. And, you know, that's, that, that's happening to everyone. And uh, I guess I'll uh, just end by uh, reiterating everything everybody said that, like, one, yeah, real, this is a real war. This is not something to be playing. The, uh, the thing that I'm seeing the most of in terms of comments and that are the, you know, the, you know, uh, anti imperialists fighting, you know, the NATO empire and that, and that there's this real, push to do this like kind of what about this what about that and rather than engage with the actual history of the uh of what we're talking about they'll try to deflect to something else and then they'll try to make you know oh it's the u.s that's the big bad here and the u.s has the the u.s isn't there um and you know the, the uh and uh, to reiterate that we need to think about the people who are there that uh, that are facing this that uh, fight fight the propaganda as best we can as historians but also redirect that support from you know ourselves to charity which is hopefully the intent of this entire stream is to fight the fight the propaganda give a greater context to the entire situation and to uh and to lend support to a a just cause all right well i think we'll end it there um i want to thank you all for joining um and uh providing your uh really valuable insights to this because i know i don't know much about enough about it so um Make sure you subscribe to all their channels as well if you haven't already. I'm sure most of you already. <laughs> Emperor Tiger Star, M. Laser, uh, Cynical Historian, Kings and Generals, um, and uh, Hikma History. Thank you, uh, Tariq, for joining us earlier. Sorry that Cody couldn't make it from Alternate History Hub, but he wishes he could be here. Um, again, the charity that um, you can support directly there, if you look above the, the chat, it's called Ukraine Save the Children Fund. Um, if you want more information about it, there's links there too. You can, you know, it's always good to check out the charities that you're supporting, make sure it's legit. Um, but until then, um, stay safe, especially um, our Ukrainian and, and Russian friends who are just trying to survive. Uh, we wish you all the best and um, thank you for watching. Whoa.